Hey, welcome everybody. A uh, very happy and uh, delayed New Year. Uh, been a while since we've had one of these Sunday sessions, so uh, appreciate everybody uh, joining us here again in in 2023. Um, kind of a different different way of doing things this year. 2022 was mostly company specific stuff. Uh, we went through 40, 45 different companies, and then uh, the junior sessions, obviously, that were another. Uh, 15 or 20 companies uh, was was more so focused on that. 2023, I want to move more towards a overall uh, overview of the different basins, a uh, bunch of engineering topics, and uh, the um, kind of other special situation uh, opportunities that I would like to discuss um, kind of more in detail. And uh, yeah, just some just some overall uh, outside Canada stuff too. So I've got some uh, sessions planned for. Uh, multinationals and what they're doing. Um, the Colombian market is is really interesting. What they're doing in the uh, Argentina shale as well. Uh, so I will uh, just add him here. So so kind of a different different tone here. I will still be updating the company specific stuff uh, as much as possible, but a lot of that will now move to kind of the Twitter Spaces and maybe <clears throat> um, specific sessions that can just have updates on. Uh, maybe all the companies all at once and and do some kind of Petro Ninja well well updates and just overall updates, kind of like the Q3 preview session was, but but maybe a bit more uh, in detail here. Uh, I am still kind of a bit, uh, I guess, suffering from this uh, a stomach illness. So uh, apologies if if uh, I got a uh, there's some sore throat and all this coming in, um, but. Yeah, so so that's kind of the plan this year. Uh, we're going to get started today with a Montney overview and discussion. Obviously, the Montney Basin um, in in Alberta, north northwestern uh, Alberta, and the northeast BC. And the goal here is is not to compare companies to each other and and talk about you know this company has the best well results. That that doesn't really apply in the Montney because it's so diversified. As in, there is uh, oil rich areas, there is condensate rich areas. Uh, you have this like NGL rich uh, gas, and then there is the dry gas the further north you go. So it's very difficult to compare uh, well by well results when when they don't really make sense. Um, as well, the the depth of the formation changes uh, quite significantly uh, throughout the basin. So so you're kind of comparing apples to oranges, where the well costs uh, differ a lot, uh, and they can. Uh, depending on where you're drilling. So it's so going more and more of an overview, a bit of a history on the Montney, where we are, a little bit on the geology. And then we'll get into some company specific kind of information and uh, overall uh, basin specific information that I think is important for anybody investing in companies uh, to kind of keep in mind, maybe just 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 have a look and follow along with. Um, so just before I begin here, I again uh, just want to reemphasize that um, this will be recorded. Uh, it is going to be available on the website as well as on YouTube. So everything stays the same. Nothing really has changed. I'm um, going to try and get this up here uh, as soon as possible. Uh, Zoom was having some sort of glitch um, last three months of last year, but they seem to have fixed it. So I hope everything here is going to go well. I also have the mailing list where I just all I send out is the event links um, kind of a day or two beforehand and then any relevant files uh, as well. So if you do want to get on there, uh, just, just shoot me an email or a Twitter DM. I am running quite behind uh, on the emails right now, as well as the DMs just after the holiday season and then this little sickness. So I'm uh, going to be trying to catch up here uh, as much as possible. And uh, my uh, schedule for the future sessions is also on the website along with the portfolio. So the portfolio uh, is still on the November. Uh, I know that. So I will update that kind of midweek here uh, with the latest. There has been some some changes for sure, uh, in, including on the bigger names and the smaller names. So, so definitely I look forward to updating that here. Uh, call it Wednesday, Thursday-ish. Um, I also received a couple emails about those uh, scam bots that are on Twitter. So I don't sell any mentorships. I don't charge for any content. Um, there's the, there's no no uh, 
uh, private Discord or WhatsApp groups or anything like that. So uh, please don't don't give your information uh, to anybody uh, because that's it's it's those Twitter bots, and I I wish they could uh, get rid of them, but uh, I'm not sure why they're having problems. Um, just doing, uh, I guess, simple stuff like that. Uh, I also mentioned earlier, I did order a mic. So for anybody who's maybe, um, uh, I guess, worried a little bit about the echo um, that will be here, uh, or it came in this morning, but I didn't get a chance to set it up. Um, we also added uh, auto closed captions on the YouTube videos as people had suggested. So please keep the suggestions coming. Um, anybody who wants, I guess, anything done a bit different, or you have other suggestions for other seminars that that um, maybe you would like to see. I always welcome that. Uh, it's it's very difficult for me to to figure out what's happening because uh, I don't rewatch my uh, recordings. So so if there is something uh, in there that's a mistake um, or, or or can be fixed, adjusted, made better, please just let me know. Uh, okay. So a couple of things before I start, and I want to make this uh, quite clear again: is please do your own due diligence. What I share is my information. It's my opinion. It's based on my interpretation of what's going on. That that may not mean that it's always going to be 100% correct. And that may not mean that all the companies are going to go 10 bagger in a year. So there is a, a specific um, a sort of due diligence process that I go through. And I try to share as much as possible. That being said, I don't share every single thing because I would just be recording myself uh, 24 seven. So uh, please, once again, do your own due diligence and, and please just watch, watch the, the, the information that I share. Some of the information is delayed after I've entered certain names um, previously. So just keep that in mind. Um, you know, this is not, this is not a, a free for all thing where you, you can just copy it and uh, everything is going to work out and you're going to get the exact same uh, performance or anything like that. Uh, so, so just keep that in mind. Also keep in mind your risk tolerance. So I have been at the oil and gas investing for about nine, nine, almost 10 years now. So there's a specific sort of not, not just a risk tolerance that's built, but a, a different sort of, um, call it mental mindset that's built around these names and the volatility that comes with it. Oil and gas has always been volatile, always. Uh, even in the down cycles from call it 2015 onwards, there were companies that were down 60, 70% in that time frame. There were companies that were up in that time frame. So it's it's not just related to oil price. There are other factors um, that are happening as well to keep in mind. Uh, the other thing I will uh, say is please keep in mind your position sizing and your portfolio construction. So I run, you know, people know this. I've, I've shared this. I run a margin portfolio. It is always in margin. And I also have options in there, and I also have junior companies in there. So um, it's a different portfolio construction than maybe a lot of people are are doing. And I also size my positions uh, as kind of things come in, uh, as the macro, uh, my view of the macro, and then and then as the opportunities kind of against each other. So a relative basis valuation. It doesn't mean that everybody should be running these sorts of portfolios. So. Um, you know, entering entering the commodity trade is is not easy. Uh, as much as it seems like there's there's all these uh, you know huge opportunities and companies have gone up X percent in in three months or six months, it's not representative of of how commodity cycles go. There there's a definite uh, not only an investment criteria component but a time component. These are not your regular businesses. These are businesses that are maybe front loaded capex heavy in the case of mining where you put in x billion of dollars or seg d where you put in x billion of dollars up front you don't get first oil till 4 5 6 years down the road so there there's definitely a a, a timeline and a gap uh, component there it is the same for any other conventional uh, oil play where there is a drilling leg there's a completions leg there is a leg for the wells to clean up there is a well uh, leg for the wells to stabilize on production. Um, there's a timeline to it. Rome wasn't built in a day and neither are oil companies. So looking at stuff from a six month time frame or a one year time frame in a, call it a growing commodity based business is just not the right way uh, to be approaching these investments. So uh, that's my view. That's why I say that I invest for the longer term. 
I'm, I'm not out here day trading and trying to uh, pick off scalps uh, uh, or, or trying to time these things. Uh, I, I invest in good companies based on a macro outlook and then kind of just let that play out uh, over a period of time and adjust accordingly as things change. So I can't take questions on Zoom right now. So uh, um, if you could just put them in the chat, uh, just to keep the natural flow of, of how things are going here, just put them in the chat. I will I will kind of respond to them as I go. And if it's something completely off topic, uh, I'll leave it to the end and then and then get to it. It's just for the sake of security. We've had issues in the past with uh, these Zooms getting hijacked. Uh, and I don't want to end up on uh, TikTok as one of those... Um, uh, you know, videos, uh, funny videos, uh, per se. So uh, that's where we are. So we'll get started here. And um, before I begin on the Montney specific stuff, I want to give two charts on the overall macro, because we haven't chatted about um, kind of overall oil prices where we are. Here is the end all be all chart of inventories. So this is as of January 11th, uh, about seven or eight days ago. Um, before I begin, Anybody on the Twitter space that uh, would like to join for the Zoom visuals, whitetundra.ca. The website is also in my Twitter uh, bio thing. And if you scroll to the bottom under events, the Zoom link is on there and you can join us for the visuals uh, as well. So, so this is kind of the, the end all be all chart here on inventories. This covers crude oil, oil products, every single type of NGL, propane, butane, it covers SPRs, and it covers floating inventories, and it covers in-transit inventories. So any ships that have oil that are loaded, they have gasoline, they're loaded, they're taking them somewhere else. So as you can see, there's nothing here that shows me that there's anything to be worried about. I see posts that are... Um, I see posts that are saying that there's this huge build in, uh, in call it, um, China. There's this huge build offshore that Russia is stocking all these barrels. There's this uh, uh, a build off the coast of Iran. So uh, just give me a sec. I'm going to fix this. There's somebody keeps trying to control the screen here. So... Okay. Um, so... Um, so as far as the overall inventories goes, not really seeing a concern. I am also presenting on the overall macro here next week. So I will share more as to why this is an even bigger um, sort of bullish sign, because what we're seeing is that the uh, high quality products are drawing and the low quality products, such as your NGLs and your propanes, uh, a petrochemical feedstocks are the ones that are building. So, so even though the inventories overall is relatively flat, you're, you're seeing this shift. And I've, I've used this example before. It's it's like, it's, um, you know, you you had a fridge that was half beer and half water. And then now, now you want to drink beer and you open the fridge and all of a sudden it's only 25% beer and 75% ended up as water. So so something like that uh, is is kind of where we are. Um, but but I will explain that more, more on sort of the macro stuff. Uh, next week there. So uh, overall, the inventory is lower than it was at the beginning of 2022. Once again, this includes SPR, commercial, floating, um, in transit, etc. Looking pretty good. And uh, keep in mind, this is this is with the Fed funds rate up for 4% 4 um, in the last year. This is with everybody scared of recession. This is with people supposedly jacking up credit card debt and losing jobs and all this. And uh, we're, we still seem to be in a pretty good place. I don't want to make this a macro session, so I'll talk about it next week uh, more in detail. Here's your three to one crack spread. So three barrels of oil converted into two gasoline, one diesel. That's your three to one crack spread. It's rising. So anybody worried about the demand for end products? Here's your... Uh, Here's your end-all be-all for the uh, refined product space. So this is rising, and this is despite the Chinese refineries kicking on and all this, all this discussion that China is going to flood the market with diesel and gasoline hasn't happened yet. And one of the reasons for this is that jet fuel comes out of the same distillation column as diesel. So as the world's jet fuel 
um, consumption is increasing very rapidly. The overall sort of diesel jet fuel is getting a bit pinched. At the same time, gasoline uh, consumption remains relatively high in the rest of the world. In the US, it is a, a little bit below uh, kind of seasonal norms, but on the overall uh, globally, we're still looking pretty good. And this is not just US Gulf Coast crack spread. This includes the Middle East, uh, the Mediterranean, uh, Europe, and then as well, the kind of the Singapore market as well. So there's a, there's a lot of new refining capacity that's come online and will be coming online. Uh, keep in mind that the US is gonna have a major turnaround season this year because a lot of them skipped turnaround last year to take advantage of this exactly. As you can see on the chart, uh, we see that the crack spreads last year had really blown out. So companies tried to push maintenance over and um, well, now, now they have to do it uh, or else you're gonna have more fires and explosions uh, like we kind of saw last year as well. So inventories are looking good. Demand is looking good. And if that's the case, then obviously you don't have an oversupply anywhere. Uh, so, so kind of given that and uh, my other thoughts on where China is, uh, where Russia is, and kind of how the U.S. is going to respond from here, I think, um, you know, my, my portfolio update will reflect um, a bit of more aggressive added on risk that I've taken on in the last, call it, um, four to six weeks, uh, yeah, given where we are. So we'll get started on the Montney here. Um, so this is this is where our Montney unconventional gas slash oil uh, fairway is. We see all the different uh, kinds of plays here. You know, excellent map by Peters and Co. here. You see the legacy uh, unconventional sort of gas basins here, Horn River and the Liard Basin. Now you see the oil sands, uh, Peace River, uh, Charlie Lake, an upcoming play in the Grand Prairie area. Uh, kind of important because it is competing directly for uh, capital and uh, not capital for labor and supply chain. So being in the same area as a big oil oil hub, uh, it is going to increase the inflation to the Grand Prairie based producers, um, as well as sort of affect the supply chain as far as water disposal, oil, uh, frac sand, etc. Now we see that the whole deep basin gas uh, a fairway here, the Duvernay, Cardium. You know, a lot of companies that people here are invested in, uh, you likely recognize these areas, the Clearwater, another up and coming area. And then you have your kind of Southeast Saskatchewan, including the Weyburn unit and uh, your Viking trend. So this is the area we're, <laughs> excuse me, we're going to focus on the, um, so there's a bunch of, Just give me a sec here. I got uh, somebody here posting uh, all kinds of stuff. So, yeah, okay. Um, that's interesting. They, they must have known it's a new Zoom link. So uh, now they can come in and, and post all kinds of trash. Um, okay, so I also see that uh, Dirk said here that the uh, Zoom link on the website isn't working. Uh, so I'm not sure what exactly, but the but the ID and the passcode does. So uh, please just use that for now because um, it's just going to take take me a while to go and update that uh, while I'm doing this. So uh, so anyway, uh, pretty good map. Uh, like I said, we're focusing here here on northwestern Alberta and then northeast BC, the two big cities, Grand Prairie and Fort Saint John, uh, are the ones to uh, focus on as kind of where the activity is going to be. So a um, little bit more on exactly who owns the land. So we see, let's look at the Northeast BC first, the north of Northeast BC. So um, Carmeline, huge producer in this area. We have Conical Phillips, who bought this uh, out of Kelt uh, in 2020. We have Arc Resources with their Attache, yet to be sanctioned, but as you know, we had some good news on the Blueberry River First Nation uh, decision here uh, last week. So keep your eye out on this. We have Pacific Cambrium as well, who are uh, kind of your, your LNG participant, uh, if you will. And then you have Petronas. And, and look, at, look at the development of Petronas. Just keep this in mind. We'll discuss this as things go on. They have maximized reserves, progress had, 
before they sold this to Petronas, proved out the entire acreage. And you can see how the development is versus the development in maybe some of these other areas. That is a more, call it full-scale field development versus what is here a exploration development and delineation development. So when you look at your companies, just try and look at the maps and see what they're doing. If they have wells absolutely side by side, that's a full scale field development. When they have kind of random wells all over the place, that's your delineation development. Um, so, you know, pretty, pretty concentrated area already. You likely will end up seeing a bit more uh, up, in, up in this area. And then when we look at the, the Montney South, the Northeast BC South, a little more companies over here. So we have Oventive, obviously, that is drilling absolutely fantastic wells. We have Crew Energy, uh, one of the big landholders here that was outside the Blueberry River First Nation. Uh, and then you got Shell. Again, uh, your LNG participants obviously need acreage. If, they're, if they want to control their own supply, they're going to want to expand in this area, especially if the LNG Canada Phase 2 comes up, uh, gets FID'd as well. Uh, we have Kelt as well, kind of to the north here. So I will discuss more why this is pretty interesting, uh, as well as uh, Spark Delta, Candlin, some of the smaller names. Here's Vermilion, what they bought from La Prada, and then Silicanth, the remaining La Prada acreage as well. So not as concentrated, uh, still quite concentrated, you can say, compared to some of the uh, other conventional fields and other unconventional fields. Uh, at the same time, um, you know, I, I will discuss later on why smaller companies are just not fit for the Montney. And we've seen this in the past where many of them have discovered absolutely prolific acreage and still went bankrupt. So it's it's more a way of the way the cycle goes and you need this big behemoth pricing power and production power in order to do anything in the Montney. And hey, small companies are still having a go at it. So all the power to them. In a bull cycle, can they make it work? Maybe. Uh, I guess we'll find out. But a lot of a lot of M and A here is still to be done. Uh, I don't think some of these companies are 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 really your full scale field developing companies. They are more so your explore, delineate, sell. Exactly what Lacrada did. So, uh, I'm looking forward to this uh, happening here. Um, you know, over the next little bit. Let's look more at uh, the Alberta side. So quite a lot of companies, a bit bigger acreage as well uh, as, it, as it goes further south. So we, you see the big names here that we are all familiar with. We, you have your Spartan Delta, you have your CNRL, you have your Arc Resources, you have uh, Kelt, Pipestone, Hammerhead, uh, basically all, all the big, big names uh, that were in your Montney liquids rich areas. So Northeast BC is more gas, Alberta is more liquids rich, and I'll discuss I'll discuss all of this in detail as I go on. This is just a, a kind of preamble overall map so people have an idea of sort of where we are as we go north here into Puscupé. Uh, again, it, it just completely gases out. So this is more of your liquids rich fairway and then you go into more of the gas, uh, a wet gas, if you will, a little bit of condensate. And then the more northeast you go, it becomes more and more uh, dry gas uh, there. So. Pretty interesting area, as you can see, a lot of companies smooshed in here, probably a lot of M&A that's gonna happen here in the next 12 to 24 to 36 months. Um, so, so this is your gas drills, this is your oil drills, very similar um, kind of acreage positioning because when a company buys acreage, they would buy the entire Monty stack uh, as opposed to doing you know something weird with that. Um, keep this in mind, again, this is a heavily produced area. You see the number of wells here that Arc Resources has drilled through their seven gens uh, acquisition. You see how there's open acreage in, in other companies like Spartan Delta, Hammerhead, very few wells drilled. So whenever you're looking at acreage maps, just try and find maps that actually have the latest drills on them. And that'll give you an idea of how much acreage is undeveloped versus how much acreage is developed. And the other thing it's going to tell you is if you see a land area with a lot of wells on it, that's kind of going to tell you that, hey, maybe the tier one acreage is starting to dwindle out. 
We can say that for sure, but companies usually drill their best acreage first. And if you see an acreage that's heavily drilled, um, you know, have a look at the well productivities and what's happening uh, year by year by year. Um, so, so yeah, so here's your kind of overall map here. You see another area where there's a lot of drilling has already happened. Uh, this is Birch Cliff, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, where some of this other area is relatively undrilled, um, especially down here, once you get into the Simonette area, which is um, more of your oil focused Montney, um, has had that relatively low uh, delineation work done so far. So here's your kind of more of a map as to the pipelines. So some major pipelines here, your, your Northeast BC connector, you have your Alliance pipeline that's going towards your Chicago area, uh, CGL, Coastal Gas Link. It's going to connect directly to LNG Canada. And, uh, you know, just, just look at where these pipelines are. Do they go through your investments acreage? Are they right there or do we have to build pipelines to it? How far away from the pipeline is your, your investment company's acreage? So why is that important? Because the further away from it you are, the higher pressure that's in the pipeline that you encounter. So if you are, call it more uh, downstream of where the pipeline begins, you're injecting your gas at a certain point that's at X pressure. Now, if you're further upstream on the pipeline, you now have to beat this pressure to get your gas in the pipeline. It's, it's just simple kind of physics. You can flow only from uh, high pressure into low pressure. Your pressure has to be higher to get your gas in the pipeline. So the further north the acreage is, just given the pipelines the way they are in BC, um, the higher pressure you're going to have to inject your gas into the uh, pipeline, which has a direct impact on your wells and how much they produce and what sort of compression horsepower you need in order to get your gas in the pipeline. This is something that not many people are, are as far as I know, aware of. It was a big problem with Pay Pony Pony um, before they got acquired by CNRL was they were always at the end of the line here trying to push their gas into this high pressure system, which again, impacted the well results. It impacted the number of infrastructure they needed to build. So uh, very important. It's gonna be even more important on the coastal gas line pipeline. So look at where the coastal gas line starts. It's way down south. So companies that are, you know, maybe a bit higher up here, um, you know, some just something to keep in mind. It's not gonna make or break companies, but it has a, it has a direct impact, uh, especially as pipelines get more filled up because Northeast BC is not really building that much pipeline capacity. There is stuff coming online, but on the overall, it's still a very seized up system, very prone to maintenance issues and, and downtime. So, um, yeah. Uh, okay, so there's a question here. How much does a compressor plant cost? So each million of gas that you want to go through your compressor, so MMCF per day, uh, about 150 BOEs, is gonna cost you about a million to $1.5 million. That's a rough number to run with. You can kind of extrapolate that uh, as you will. Um, uh, how much does the pipelines cost? Uh, I don't really think it matters um, right now. And I, I don't have that number for you, uh, but you can look up the coastal gas link, what it cost and what the length of it is uh, to give you a rough idea for, for where we are today. Uh, yeah, I don't have the number on me, unfortunately. Here is more of your geologic map. So 94G, here is 94G up here, 94H, 94H. So, so just so you can put the maps side by side. You can see how there's a specific dry gas window right here. You can see there's a wet gas window right here. And then you have an oil window kind of more towards the Eastern side. Um, the, the whole basin is, is at an angle. So it's not really an Eastern side. It's more like of a Northeast uh, a, a northeastern side is more for oil window. Once again, when you're looking at your companies, what are you trying to buy? If you're trying to buy a dry gas Montney producer, look for companies with acreage more towards the Southwest. If you're trying to buy this oily focused Montney, look for companies more to the Northeast. Um, so 
not as much delineation done in the oil window uh, per se, but but there's a lot of work uh, still going on. There's a lot of fresh acreage still up here. Uh, Kelt is doing a lot of work in this area to figure out uh, where where sort of the 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 basin ends, uh, as well as tourmaline as well. So just keep that in mind. Which companies you want to invest in, and this is why you can't compare Montney as like oh is is X company's wells better than Y company's wells? Because one might be in a dry gas window and the other is in an oil window. So how can you really compare um, th those two things? Um, okay, so as I continue on, I'll just keep saying this over and over because I know people join the Twitter space late. Uh, if you do want to join for the uh, visuals, uh, whitetundra.ca, scroll to the bottom and the Zoom link is on there. I've been informed it's not working, so you will have to put the uh, password and the ID in uh, manually, which is also in that same same kind of paragraph there uh, under events. So, okay, so where are we? Two different areas. We have your Northeast BC, very little liquids production, you know, not much growth, but the gas production has gone up significantly. It has almost doubled since January of 2017. And this is despite the Blueberry River First Nation uh, seize up that was happening. So producing well counts are going up. You have your gas production going up. Looks like a pretty good growth basin. And the wells are coming out really strong, as I will talk about. Uh, on the other side, we have our uh, Alberta Montney production. So once again, gas is going up not as fast because the Alberta Montney is more a liquids focused uh, formation. And as you can see, the, the liquids is, is much higher, but it's showing relatively flat. And the reason for that is just the way that liquids are reported in Alberta. Some of them are reported not at the wellhead level, but at the plant level. So because they're reported that way, um, this graph is not really correct, in my opinion. We, we actually have gained a lot of liquids growth in the last uh, few years. So once again, if you're on Petro Ninja, looking at Montney wells in Alberta, keep in mind, not all of them report condensates at the well level. So you might be getting some misinformation. If you just look at that, uh, you almost have to look at um, the overall sort of uh, company, what the company is putting out for their liquids and then, and then bring it back to the wells themselves, just based on a uh, kind of CGR condensate gas ratio or an OGR. Uh, oil gas ratio. Um, so a little bit more information here on the history of the play. So you can see here the uh, BC. We'll start with BC and we'll and then we'll go to Alberta. So you look at non montney gas. You know we had about 2.5 BCF in in 2005. That's mostly from the Horn River, from the Liard. Uh, Musqua shales up, up like way northern BC. That has died off because it's sour gas. It's very expensive. It's very deep. It's difficult to abandon and a lot of reclamation cost on that. Um, so at the same time, we have our, we have the Montney gas that's gone from zero BCF in 2008 to about four and a half, five BCF in 2022. So uh, definitely things have changed. The Montney has taken over, uh, and also the Montney share of BC, look at that go. It went from 0% to 90% in 15 years. And at the same time, the Montney BC share of the Western Canadian sedimentary basin gas went from 0 to about 30% in the same 15-year period. Um, yeah, okay, so I got another um, issue here happening, so just give me a sec here. Uh, yeah, so Dirk, I will make you uh, the co-host um, and then just bear with me here, guys. Um, appreciate your help as always, Dirk. Okay, so we'll remove a couple guys here. Um, <clears throat> So once again, please put any questions in the chat. I I, I just cannot uh, open the audio because there's just too much security risk uh, of the um, uh, Zoom being taken over. Uh, okay. 
Yeah, so Dirk, if you can please assist with that, I uh, appreciate that. Um, okay, so we'll continue on here. So, uh, okay, just give me a sec. Dirk, can you remove uh, Lester U up, please? Um, uh, okay, so <clears throat> appreciate it. And Liam as well, if you don't mind. Um, so, okay, so, so when we look at the BC Montney gas um, here on the right side, you can see how the play has, has changed over the years. Like when they first started, these wells were not that good at all and they were very expensive. And now where we are, um, the not only have the wells gone cheaper, but the productivity has gone almost 5x. So you see the 2005 max, you see the 2020 max um, as to where we are. So it's so almost five times. This is your first year MMCF per day of production. Uh, you see the same here on, on this graph right here. Just, just look at the growth here. And the reason I like to mention this is because the Montney is very early in its development stage. So we have lots of untapped Monty acreage, undeveloped Monty, Monty acreage, but there's about 15 years of history that's gone into this. And uh, operators have learned as to um, sort of where uh, the best drilling methods are, the best fracking methods, the optimal completions, the optimal well lengths, uh, et cetera. But at the same time, the Monty hasn't been really all that much drilled. So, they have learned all these things. They have also learned from the Haynesville, the Marcellus, the Barnett, the Permian. And we have all this undeveloped acreage that can now be developed at the best economics in a structural bullish cycle. And that's really where Canada has a significant advantage over what's happened um, in the last, last kind of few years in the US. The US blew through all their acreage in $1.50 MCF gas. They blew through their oil acreage in a $40 to $50 oil environment, um, whereas the Montney is still relatively untapped. Uh, kind of for Alberta's own doing, because they never built enough pipeline capacity to get the, the basin drilled properly. <laughs> so uh, a, a blessing in disguise. Here is also your BC Montney gas wells by 60th month of production. So why is this important? Because we want to see how these wells tail out. So not only is the first year important, the fifth year is also important. So as you can see, significant gains here. This adds to your uh, expected ultimate recovery of the wells um, as kind of the wells go on. Uh, you see, okay, well, five years down the road, it's still making a million of gas per day rather than 0.28. And at the same time, we see the horizontal lengths have not really increased all that much. Again, why is that important? Because that means it's not like the like the Permian where the well costs went through the roof because they, they were drilling three mile laterals instead of one mile laterals now to get the same kind of oil. Um, BC Martin has always had longer wells. So the well costs have not gone up that much. At the same time, your production is up significantly. So very very compelling investment case um, if you are somebody who believes in sort of the gas story is that other investors paid for the last 15 years of discovery, delineation, bankruptcies, low gas pricing, uh, figuring out fracking, figuring out drilling, they already paid for it. We come in now at a time when LNG is, we can kind of see it on the horizon here. Um, gas demand is going up globally and the acreage has been very well delineated and companies are trading at two to three times cash flow, four times cash flow. So, you know, when people ask, how can you be a, a perma bull? The bear case is really hard to find with these companies. They survived the absolute depths of hell for the last 15 years. And now you're telling me that they're going to go bankrupt because some random thing is going to happen or a U.S. recession is going to take them under? Not, not a very strong case. 
Um, <clears throat> okay, so let me give you a latest update. That was till 2020, and uh, you know maybe you were feeling a bit bullish. Here's here's 2022. Well, productivity is up 60 percent from 2020 to 2022. 60 percent. Why? Because better completions technologies. We just know now which completions work, uh, the, the, the right number of frac stages and the right kind of frac sand. So Northeast BC is an absolutely phenomenal, prolific area. And it still hasn't peaked in terms of its well productivity, not even close. So we see here the wells 2021, you know, lower, but then they have this, this, this shallower decline. Uh, 2022, whatever companies were doing, they were overproducing the wells. So yeah, you had a great first year, but the decline rates are a little bit higher. That's just the way things go with, with more advanced completions technologies. You often will get higher rates up front and then a drop off um, sort of as time goes on. We see here the average well length didn't really change. It in fact went down last year. Um, and then the, the, the overall production went up despite the number of completions in 2022 going down. So this could be both a positive and a negative. If you think that there's enough demand that we could actually consume all this gas and still keep prices high, that's, that's really great for the companies that hold acreage in this area. However, it leads to the same question. Are companies gonna overdrill, overcapitalize and crash the ACO price? There, there is kind of your, your, your red flag scenario when the wells are so good um, and there's so much undrilled acreage. So just something to keep in mind. Let's look at Alberta. So Montney, as you can see, relatively smaller on the gas side uh, because as you know, it's more liquids focused acreage. Uh, we see still the Motney share of Alberta has gone from about zero in 07 to about 10% in 2016 to almost 25% now in 2022. So the Motney share is growing uh, as the Motney liquids production grows, it, the gas is just gonna grow with it. You see the same on the well productivity. The wells are not as good, but the productivity rates are still increasing year, year by year. Not exactly true in the last five years. And that's because once again, companies are focused more on liquids now. They want these, these heavy uh, uh, liquids ratio wells, they want condensates, they want the NGLs. So they're not as focused on the gas, which is great for investors who, who want more of a liquids component weighting to their companies. It's nice that companies have realized, hey, let's focus on the oil positions and we can leave the gas for when it's actually needed and the prices are much higher. Um, that being said, you can see that the overall trend on the 60th month of production is still rising. Um, I would expect this to flatline or decrease here, given kind of the trend you see here on the uh, IP365 rates. And this is one area where horizontal length have actually continued to go up, um, just, just given that uh, for, for more liquids wells, the higher, longer uh, wells end up doing better, um, especially on tier one acreage. So probably flat lines here. I don't think it's going to go up too much uh, more than this, but, but you know, compared to the BC acreage, much different. And, you know, again, highlighting that we cannot just compare Montney as one thing. It, it's a very diverse basin. Um, so, so there's different companies with different acreages that are, that are targeting a different liquids content, uh, that are targeting different benches in the Montney and running different drilling and completions techniques. This is Alberta and Montney combined. So once again, just kind of reiterates what I'm saying. The Montney is becoming a huge play. It's now about 45% of Western Canadian sedimentary basin gas. And you can see the non-Montney gas supply has gone from 16 BCF to about 10 BCF in the last 15 to 16 years. So declining, that's your deep basin, that's your uh, Liard basin, Horn River, that's your other conventional gases, whereas the Montney supply is, is kind of the thing that's keeping it flat to increasing. Looks very similar to like a conventional oil versus 
shale oil, a chart that I posted the other day. So it's it's very similar across across North America, where unconventional is taking over from conventionals. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dirk. Uh, I think we're uh, good to go right now. So, okay, break even cost. This is where the Montney absolutely destroys any U.S. acreage. It's not even close. So, and I'll and I'll discuss more as things go on. People say the Haynesville is this, the Marcellus is that. The Montney is way better than than both of those. When you look at the break even cost of supply. Here's your Western Canadian sedimentary basin Montney, about 50 cents and NMBTU. You have a bunch of Permian in here. Why? Because the Permian is targeting liquids. And so as they get the gas, it's relatively free to kind of produce the cost of supply is just about zero. Um, and then we see our, our Haynesville formations come up here. There is some Montney uh, in here as well. Um, okay. Uh, so, so it's kind of just a, a chart that goes through. It gives you the, the different benches and the different tiers. Um, Dirk, can you remove Maximilian, please? Um, so, yeah, so, so just keep that in mind. You have your lowest cost gas here. You have your tier one acres in the Montney still left, whereas some of these U.S. acreages, you know, you're, you're getting into some of the more um, drilled up acreages. So, okay. Once again, we're, we're seeing the productivity increase. It has been a step change in the last two years, an actual step change, both in the IP rates and in the cumulative rates. So something that I think it's very important to keep in mind that in Northeast BC, the companies that are running reserves of 2020 well results, 2021 well results, expect to see a big increase in that. Um, are we gonna see that in 2022 reserve reports? Maybe, but it's it's definitely a bonus as um, more investment professionals look at the net asset values, you're gonna get this step change increase in productivity that's reflected in these as time goes on. And also, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the acreage is undrilled. So the step change productivity increase applies to a massive amount of acreage. And if the oil and gas price cooperates, you now get this huge gain at a much higher pricing. When your break-even cost is so low, all of that is additional net back. You can see where I'm going with this. So uh, reserve reports should be out in March or so, and we will see what, what's changed. I was at one point looking to incorporate a uh, uh, reserves into my spreadsheets. It, it is still um, kind of coming, but I, I just found it very difficult to, to quantify reserve values at different WTI and ACO pricings. So gonna be one of my goals in 2023 amongst other things um, as well. So Alberta productivity, this is more of a gas. So you see pipes on Wapiti going up. You see Glacier, Puskupe really rising. Uh, southeast and other Montney, so you're talking about your Simonette areas, um, looking good. Kakwa declining. So the Kakwa seven gens acreage is the most drilled up acreage in the Montney so far. So it's going to give us a good, call it three to five year upfront information on what's going to happen with the rest of the Montney when they get to a certain amount of wells drilled on the acreage. The Kakwa is by far the most drilled area. Why? It is an absolutely phenomenal acreage. Seven gens grew from zero to 200,000 BOEs per day in a span of five to six years. It is that prolific. And, and remember, that was in a $60 WTI and $3 gas, sub $3 gas environment. Um, and they still made money. So, um, you know, but I will talk about Kakwa more a little bit later on because. What's happening in Kakwa is very similar to my concerns with the Permian and the shale productivity in that area. Now, when we look at oil productivity, relatively flat. So the Wembley car area is looking good, which is just north of Grand Prairie, uh, your, your Gordondale area, uh, Progress, and your Anti Creek, Simonette, uh, all, all sort of flat ish um, at the moment. So 
Um, okay. So, um, yeah, and that, and that excludes plant condensate and NGLs once again. It's unfortunate because it makes a huge difference in how we look at these wells. And I just wish the Alberta system would get better at reallocating that back to the wellhead level. Here's your British Columbia Montney supply stack. What it tells you is what is the break-even cost of supply for how much resource? There is a hundred TCF of resource that's good down to 10 cents, 10 cents NMMCF. So we take that, we say there is about 375 TCF that's good to $1.50, 325 TCF, I should say. And uh, to give you sort of, to put that in context, if you're producing, call it 10 BCF per day, yeah, call it 10 BCF per day, you're producing about four TCF per year. So, so Alberta and BC produce about 16 BCF per day. If we started producing 10 from the Montney in two or three years, that's about four TCF a year. There is 325 TCF. That's good down to $1.50. That is the scale of this resource and why Canada has completely shot themselves in the foot by continually delaying LNG projects, by continually adding restrictions and uh, uh, other unreasonable requirements uh, compared to what the US has done uh, and are really profit profiteering from shipping LNG exports uh, to the Europe and making royalties, taxes, income taxes, shipping, um, all, all sorts of economic benefits from doing this. Um, so, so I look forward to LNG Canada one coming online, and and really some of the other other ones as well, uh, including Cedar um, uh, as well. So, um, and the other one, which whose name I'm forgetting right now, um, I apologize, QE. Uh, so, so anyway, a very low cost um, basin, very very competitive on a global scale, very environmentally friendly, and. Uh, I think the lowest greenhouse gas emissions uh, for natural gas production uh, in North America, for sure. A little bit more on the history. We'll go back all the way to, to, to 2001. You see how the wells were so bad. Now they're significantly better. This only goes to 2017. We are now at about seven, uh, seven MCF per day, so even much higher. So I love, I love acreages like this where somebody else spent 15 years, 20 years delineating something, I get to come in right now and buy companies at three to four times cash flow. Great, I'll, I'll take those deals all day long. Um, you know, They suffered through bankruptcies, they suffered through 15 years of not making any money, uh, opportunity cost, et cetera. I'll come in and gladly buy them. That's exactly why I think there's gonna be a lot of M&A in the space because companies will eventually realize like, hey, Let's just pay a little bit extra and take over this 40, 60, 100 year reserve uh, and just get on with it. Uh, frack stages, again, we had about 30 frack stages in 2016. We are now at about 100 plus, sometimes 200 plus frack stages. You can see how things have gone up uh, as, as time has gone on. The research process, if you will, as time goes on and why I will once again repeat, Rome wasn't built in a day and oil companies are not built in six months. These are decade-long processes that we have the opportunity to enter. Um, not investment advice, this is my own interpretation um, of, of the situation we are in, and I get to buy these companies uh, with relatively lower risk, uh, as far as geology is concerned, um, into a what I feel is a bullish oil and gas cycle, as everybody knows. Um, a little bit more on the pipelines, as you see, gas is a big deal in shale plays. Why? Because if you can't get rid of your gas, you can't produce your oil. It's just the way it goes. So you're not gonna be allowed to flare. You're not gonna be allowed to vent gas. You have to produce it and put it into a pipeline. Uh, we see West Coast Energy going into Washington State. We see the T North, uh, Montney T North, Nova Gas, and then your alliance, again, going to Chicago. There is a bit of extra capacity coming online in the NGTL, the Nova Gas lines. But as you see, 
your, your alliance is relatively maxed out. And then as well, your West Coast pipeline is, is relatively maxed out. Uh, Tourmaline being a company taking advantage of this to ship gas into California, make 10, 15, $20 NMBTU. Uh, NGTL, not, not all damage growth. Uh, your coastal gas link is your main feeder line in the next call it two years. That's going to kick, kick on uh, at about two BCF per day of incremental export out of the basin. So keep this in mind. If you're a growth company, if you're investing in growth companies, make sure they have firm transportation capacity. So you don't want them to be, you know, going about um, here and there, growing production, and then, oh, we can't even produce this gas because uh, we don't have the pipeline space. You don't want to end up in that situation. Trust me. There are companies that have got slapped doing this, um, not understanding where the base and supply demand is, not understanding where the firm transportation is, and not willing to pay the price up front to lock in firm, rather going on this floating thing. Um, can you make more money doing it? Possibly. Very risky when the export capacity is this tight. A better map, overall map, you see Coastal Gas Link, you see T South, T North, your uh, NGTL system, and then Alliance going to uh, Chicago, and then more of your kind of Alberta focused pipelines, your Empress lines, um, and the Foothills lines that go through the deep basin and then take gas uh, to the East Coast and into the US. Chicago, Dawn, um, those big hubs out east, which is where the population is. So, therefore, a lot of the pipelines will end up going to where the population is, where the consumption is. Um, pretty good planning uh, in that way. Uh, wood fiber, that's the other LNG. Yeah, wood fiber. Um, okay, let's get into the uh, technical engineering details a bit. So uh, I will just repeat, anybody that wants to join for the Zoom session, uh, whitetundra.ca, scroll to the bottom under events, uh, and Zoom link is in there. The link exactly is not working, but you can copy paste the ID and the password and you can get in there. So where is the Monty? The Monty is about 6,500 to 11,000 feet deep. So call it two to 3,500 meters, 2,000 to 3,500 meters deep, quite a deep formation. Uh, the thickness is really good. Uh, the net thickness in some cases, 500 feet. The uh, thermal maturity, I'm not exactly sure what this is. Uh, but we can see how it compares to the Marcellus, the Haynesville, and the Barnett, the three big basins in the US. And this is really the important ones. Permeability, around 350 nano Darcy permeability. <clears throat> this graph down here compares the permeability of different formations. And what this means, permeability means, how many cracks in the rock are there that allow oil and gas to naturally flow within the rock. So, so if you drill into the rock, you create a low pressure zone, is the oil and gas can naturally flow. We see our areas like the Sparky and Southeast Saskatchewan, very high natural permeability, which means you don't need to frack. You just drill a well and the oil flows, easy peasy. In the case of gas shales or oil shales, the Montney is not a true shale, and I'll talk about this later on, but in the case of gas and oil shales, the permeability is about 350 nano Darcy, all the way down here. To visualize this, think about your granite countertops. That is exactly the permeability of a shale. So the, the goal that you're trying to do is let's say there's a big layer of oil just underneath your granite countertop. You now have to force it through the granite and on the top side, can you do it? Well, you can, you know, you can be the biggest bodybuilder in the world. You will not be able to put enough force into that, that, that liquid from underneath to push it through the granite and on top. And therein comes the problem. That's why this oil and gas has been trapped for decades, decades, because nobody could figure it out. How, how are we going to get this out? So what they did, they fractured the granite using high pressure water and just like put really high pressure in this small area, closed it off, and then put so much pressure on this water that it literally fractured the granite. 
awesome. Now the oil can flow through. You don't have to put all that much pressure on it. You may not even have to put any pressure. It will naturally flow up. So, uh, so that, that kind of gives you a visualization of how it is. Whereas if you want to think about the more of the conventional uh, reservoirs, it's like a layer of sand. So instead of granite, think about a layer of sand. You now have oil underneath this, and you're trying to push it through the sand. It wouldn't take that much pressure to push it up and, and have it show up on the other side. Um, it's pretty obvious because this is the way that oceans work. They literally carve through the sand and go into and above the sand. So it uh, gives you a bit of a, a understanding uh, of that. The, the porosity number, about 2 to 4.5%, um, it varies. Porosity varies. It can be from one to five to six, seven percent uh, in some cases, but that's that's roughly where you are. You see, the Haynesville has a bit higher porosity, um, and you take all these factors into consideration, and you end up with a gas in place. How much gas is in place per section? Section meaning one mile by one mile, one square mile of land. You have about two hundred bcf of gas per section. Um, and, and I think the Montney is 50,000 square miles, if I'm not mistaken. So, so think about that, 200 BCF of gas per square mile, and there's 50,000 square miles. Of that, Canada produces roughly 16 BCF per day, 16 to 18 BCF per day. So each section gives you 10 days. There's 50,000 of them. You have 500,000 days worth of resource. Uh, in here, not 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 all of it can be produced, obviously, but gas recovery factors are are relatively high uh, for the most part. You have your pressure gradient, which tells you as you go from surface, as you go deep, how much pressure does increase? How much does the pressure increase? 0.65 psi per foot, pounds per square inch per foot. Um, yeah, so. Roughly the same in in you know throughout throughout the world really it's all the same, and then you get your EUR per, per well uh, on top of that. So that's a bit on the uh, geologic side of what's happening here. Um, you know, give you an understanding why shale is so hard, why people couldn't figure it out until now, um, and and kind of where we are, and also why the shale um, is is just so expensive because you have to do these completion techniques that you don't have to do in the conventional side. So a little bit more on the gas, the Monty gas. Here is your Marcellus. It grew from zero to 25 BCF in a decade, overcapitalized. Here's your Haynesville. It grew from zero to 15 BCF in 12 years, relatively overcapitalized. What happens to these gas formations in the US? Because they have a heavier decline rate, this is what happens to them. When you overcapitalize these formations, you get this very small peak, and then they fall off. It's a very small peak, and then they fall off. In less than a decade, you're producing a third of your peak, and you're barely able to sustain that. The Montney, because it's export limited, will never have this sort of growth scenario. You just can't. You would have to build another 10, 20 BCF of export pipeline. Knowing the, the Canadian government and the pace of development there for infrastructure, not going to happen. So this allows the Montney to have a more of a normalized, if you just follow my, follow my mouse here, a very long normalized reserve, 40, 50, 60 year reserve. An inherent benefit to investors. Because not only do you get a really nice reserve life, you also are not spending all your cash flow into the ground to get this like un, unsustainable growth phase that then peaks out and dies. So once again, here's your US basins. Looks very similar to the Permian. Here's what happens. So, um, you know, kind of two points there. You, the Monty producers are much better set up for growing production sustainably. You as an investor are not 
are not going to be exposed to like this egregious pace of development. Um, and also as the US basins possibly decline into this, these bigger basins, there's a natural gap to fill. Not right now. I'm talking three, four, five years down the road. At the same time, if LNG comes online, double whammy, bang, North American natural gas could become very profitable despite the fact that we have a metric like global, ton, uh, a whole planetary ton of it uh, that's in the ground. So um, keep this in mind. Canada is going to be a very strategic North American gas producer in four to five years. Uh, if somebody has a long enough investment time frame and uh, you're looking to get into companies for like a the way people used to invest for these multi-decade uh, investment uh, sort of scenarios. And then they say, you know, Apple and all this, they say, oh yeah, I made a thousand X on Apple. Well, you bought it early enough. You you saw what was coming and you just sat on it. So very compelling, uh, even from a longer term um, investment scenario. Um, yeah, again, this is not investment advice. This is, I'm sharing my opinion, the reason that I enter some of these names and, and my own sort of investment thesis uh, around this, especially because I invest on more of a longer term uh, basis as opposed to a three or six month hold. Um, a bit like ESG, having some external breaks applied. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit like ESG, yeah. ESG has, has really been the reason um, why a lot of infrastructure has not been developed and it's why the Canadian basins cannot expand production uh, the same way. So um, you can see how conventional gas and oil were the big deal in, in the 2000s. Now you see how the Monty just took over, absolutely just took over um, without, without anything slowing it down until it hit sort of its export capacity constraints, which is where we are today. Uh, what, when we look at the reserves, we don't have that much booked reserves in these basins. So when I say there's five to 600 TCF of recoverable resource, maybe 10%, maybe 5% is actually shows up in reserve reports. Once again, once, once investors believe that we are in an energy scarcity environment, People start looking at not cash flows, but net asset values. And if a company's net asset value, as they drill more, as they keep adding to reserves, as the net asset value keeps going up, makes for a very uh, compelling sort of case. Okay, so we'll get into some of the company stuff here. This is Crew Energy, and I've discussed this chart before. Um, so multiple benches in the Montney. It's not just one zone. There are multiple zones within the upper Montney. There are multiple zones within the lower Montney. And there are some zones in the middle Montney as well. Very less, but, but they are still there. So within the upper Montney, you have an AA, A, B, C, all different zones with their own productivity. You can literally stack wells, what we call the cube development. Um, so, so Montney stack, wells right on top of each other, and they're all productive as long as you can make sure the fracks are not interfering with each other. And look at look at the geology a little bit more here. So the upper Montney kind of is bigger and then it becomes smaller, whereas the lower Montney is smaller and then it gets bigger as you go east. So this is going from west to east, from Manias to Tower. Uh, tower being the most eastern acreage that crew has. So um, the lower Montney has relatively been not targeted uh, all that much. So as companies go into this, as they delineate this, even more reserves to add, even more drilling locations to add. Fantastic. This is the same thing in more of a 3D format. So you can see you have your upper target, middle target, and lower target. Because the Montney is a 500 meter thick acreage, you can plant multiple wells on top of each other. The distance between uh, the top well and the, and the next bottom well is kind of what you need to make sure so that there's no uh, fracture communication. 
And then this is called your well spacing. So the spacing between the wells on a horizontal basis is called your well spacing. Companies will run different kinds of well spacings either to maximize your per well recovery or to maximize the number of uh, the amount of oil and gas you get out of an individual section. So what does it mean? Look at your company's well spacings and what they're doing, especially if they're changing them around year to year. So companies with less acreage will usually have tighter well spacings because they want to maximize the amount of oil and gas to recover out of their little box. Whereas companies with huge acreage will have wider well spacing, which allows each well to produce way more oil, but because each well produces way more oil, they have a lot of less wells per box, so they end up recovering less oil and gas on that box. They can always go back and infill drill, a refrack, um, do a cleanup job, et cetera, but all of that costs money. And if your well is gonna be drilling in the middle of two other wells, its productivity is not gonna be as good. So that's something that's gonna be well down the road. It's something that the Permian is suffering from. Again, I will discuss more of this uh, next week. So here's your gamma, here's your porosity. You can see how the porosity signature is really nice. Um, and then the gamma signature um, kind of cuts off down here, which is your shale. So the further to the left that the gamma signature is, you've hit kind of a very tight shale formation. And that's what's kind of underneath the mountain here um, and on top as well. That's what keeps your oil and gas within a certain confined box, uh, if you will. Um, okay. So I don't, I don't have much information on the Horn River Basin, unfortunately, but it was a big, big, big basin. It might still see some development as uh, gas prices go higher, but it is a very deep, expensive ac uh, acreage to operate. It is a lot of sour gas, and companies just don't want to deal with, with that sort of thing um, at, just at this time. The Horn River was, was really drilled in, call it early 2000s, when gas prices were eight, 10, 12, 15 dollars and an MCF. So we have a long ways to go before those kinds of acreages become important again, just because the Montney has so much supply. If gas in Alberta got to six, seven, eight, ten 10 bucks, they would just start drilling like everything out of the Montney and start building pipelines. Of course, there's a lag effect on that, which could be multiple years, but the Horn River Basin has the same lag effect. Like there's only so much pipeline um, to go through. So uh, here's a bit more about the, uh, what we were calling the cube development. So you see how the wells are. The, the well right on top of the, the other well is never like uh, parallelly on the same, uh, is never parallelly same. It's, it's kind of like this wine rack method just to prevent fracture communication. So this is another thing that they've learned over the years. Uh, you can see how we have the upper middle Montney and then the lower Montney as well on top of that. And you can see how many wells they're, they're, they're putting in here. So, um, you know, it's, it's one square mile this way, which is about 1500 meters, 1600 meters. And usually companies will run about a 200 meter well spacing. So you can get up to six to eight wells in the same section um, parallelly. And then you can do up to five to six benches, depending on how aggressive you want to get. Um, nobody has made the full cube development really work. Uh, and Canada tried it and they failed horrendously. Um, so, so there's a limit as to how many wells you can start piling in um, because the well productivity does drop and, and there is a risk of communication. Anytime you frack something, the fracture could go any which way. And there could be natural fractures in the rock. There could be other uh, uh, shale zones in the rock that make the fracture go a different way than what you would have thought. So not recommended to drill this uh, 64 well pattern. Um, but again, I don't, I don't make those decisions, so uh, it's not up to me. Here's uh, a little bit more geologically what's happening. So as I mentioned, the upper Montney more towards the uh, west is bigger and then the lower Montney is smaller. As you go more into the Alberta side, your, your upper Montney completely disappears and you get this lower Montney 
that is sh much shallower, easier to drill, and the lower monotony has a higher liquids content. So that's why we drill the lower monotony in Alberta. Your Charlie Lake is a formation that gets completely squished out. So to make up for this uh, change in the monotony, it's your Charlie Lake that gets uh, like totally gone. And then you have your kind of your shale zone on top and your shale zone on bottom as the, um, I don't exactly know what, what the term for this is, but, but as you move from the Triassic um, era to the Jurassic era. Um, yeah, so cruise acreage is actually right on the coastal gas link pipeline, um, as well as other major pipelines. So there's, there's kind of a reason that um, they have a very, very highly regarded acreage package. It's also, <coughs> excuse me, it's also outside the Blueberry River First Nation um, area. So, so there's kind of a natural benefit from that. Um, why is frack communication a problem? So it's a problem because let's say you have a, a well making 100 barrels per day and you frack near it and um, you now have communicated the fracks, oil and gas will always flow to a lower pressure zone. So the, well that are, the wells that are already uh, producing are gonna be a lower pressure zone. So your new well, instead of producing at max rates, is now gonna start leaking oil and gas into the older well, which may not have the pressure to get the, all that liquids up. So now you've got to install a gas lift and your new well might become a complete dud because everything just starts flowing into the lower pressure zone. So uh, you don't want frack communication um, no matter what. When we used to produce, uh, when I used to operate wells in the Grand Prairie area and there was a frack happening nearby, all my wells in the area would get shut in because there, if the frack communicated, your well could suddenly go from making like 10 decks of gas, E3, M3, to hundreds of decks of gas and immediately pressure it up. In some cases, pressure it up to the point that your separator explodes or there's some major equipment damage. Um, I've even seen cases where the entire tubing strings can come out of the well um, because so much pressure got communicated, maybe like a monty frack communicated with a different zone uh, uh, well, and the setup for the well was not such that um, uh, that uh, it could handle it. And uh, I wish I could share the video, but um, I don't know if I have it anymore, but but there's this video in, I won't name the operator, uh, in the Grand Prairie area about two years ago. Yeah, about, about two-ish years ago, um, where the entire tubing string got launched out of the well so think about 3,000 meters of heavy steel, five-inch um, diameter pipe um, shooting out of the well. Yeah, not, not good. Um, you don't want this, these things to be happening. So, okay, uh, let's talk a little bit more about the geology. So we have the upper montany is a silly clastic reservoir, uh, silly sea clastic reservoir, and the middle and lower montany is a bioclastic reservoir. Clastic just means broken pieces. So take any rock that you see somewhere, smash it up, and you end up with a clastic environment. So how does it happen? It happens because of weathering. It happens because of glaciers coming in, crushing the rock. It happens because of waves and tides that come in and continually beat on cliffs, and they destroy them into little pieces. And the pieces go, and they fall somewhere. Then, uh, OK, so, so then what happens? In the bioclastic reservoirs, you have plants and dead animals that burrow in between these, uh, call it sand or silt or rocks, whatever, uh, mud. They just they just burrow in there. They die. That over millions of years becomes your oil and your gas. That's as simple as it is. In the silicy clastic reservoirs, it is more of a silt stone. So it's not this fine grained sand. It's more of a a, a small quartz like a very small quartz. And the, the oil and gas in that is, is not from a, from a bio, like dead plants. Um, yeah, I'm actually sure not, not exactly where the oil and gas in, in silicy clastic uh, reservoirs form, but um, still working on my geology work. Uh, but, but either way, that's, that's kind of the difference. That's why the um, middle and lower montany are more liquids because it's literally dead 
uh, algae and plants and animals, which more so become liquids, whereas the upper Montney is, is a lot of gas-focused um, uh, development drilling. There is still condensates here, don't get me wrong, but, but it's more uh, gas-focused uh, reservoir, uh, especially in the Northeast BC part of things. So um, yeah, that's, that's a bit more. Here's a below zone, which is kind of your, your lower shale uh, as well. Currently sitting at a CNRL frac site, Leland area. Uh, um, I don't know where Leland is, unfortunately, but if you give me the LSD, I can uh, tell you right now uh, if it's Monty or not. Um, okay. So a bit more here. So uh, just to get into the geology a bit, you can see more about the lower Montney uh, siltstones and the, the bio uh, classic environment. And then the upper ones uh, are your other siltstones. I'm not going to go into this because I don't understand this, what these words mean. But all I'm trying to say is that these are very well delineated areas. This is not something some guy just came in and started producing. They, this is multiple decades of, of geologic um, mapping, uh, well logging about uh, reservoir parameters, about oil and gas uh, uh, parameters and lab testing. So, so there's a lot, there's a lot of things that we know already. And um, you know, once again, as I showed here, just because you drill a well in one area doesn't mean it's the same elsewhere. So there's always like a, you always have to have well control in your area, but you can generally map out the reservoirs based on extrapolation. So if you have a well here and you have a well here and you can map those out, you can extrapolate what's in the middle for the most part. And you can kind of see this is a relatively large area that they've mapped out here um, from all the way Western, uh, uh, or sorry, Eastern BC to Western Alberta. Okay, so people uh, didn't believe in the Montney. So this is 2014. The Montney Basin, hottest play in North America or just a lot of hype? Uh, spawning a new bubble, it said in 2014. Uh, and, and here we go. The LNG industry was already on top of mind in 2014. We still don't have an LNG facility built in Canada. Embarrassing. So now that we're close, a lot of this optimism that was in 2014 is finally getting uh, realized, if you will. Here we go. Here's another comment from the same article. Almost every gassy operator has a slide in the presentation that notes they're very close to LNG. This was the reason some of these companies were selling for absolutely huge premiums because they were waiting for LNG. What happened? Uh, nothing really happened. They couldn't get the LNG terminal built. They couldn't get the coastal gas link built. Companies started leaving. They started selling their acreage. And now we're back in the same exact time frame, where we're, we're two to three to four years from major LNG projects, uh, not just one, multiple of them uh, coming online. So um, again, I won't beat a dead horse. So what happened uh, during that time? Progress Energy, whose uh, acreage I sh shared earlier, had to make a counter offer to buy petrol. Uh, no, Petronas had to make a counter offer to buy Progress Energy for $5.1 billion. There's been some major MA that has already happened in this area. Then there was this lull phase because oil and gas prices dropped, LNG never got built. And now we're coming back into the 2014 euphoria. Not, not quite there yet, not even close, but it's going to get there uh, as long as oil and gas commodity prices cooperate and you have a strong view sort of on the macro and where things are going. Uh, here's one that was very interesting to me, a quote that says the hype over these junior Canadian Montney stocks is unbelievable. It's not going to end well. It did not end well uh, because uh, like this, this quote was referring to the seven generations IPO, which was about late 2014, $18 a share is what it happened at. And, um, as you know, seven gens sold to Arc Resources, and the value of that that share of seven gens switching to Arc is today about eighteen dollars and fifty cents a share. So in nine years, eight and a half years, the IPO investors made zero, nothing. 
Um, they never got dividends. They like they they never really got anything for the company growing to the scale that it did. Um, so so it didn't end well. A lot of junior junior Montney companies went bankrupt. Many of them, Sequence, Delphi, even some of the older ones that that I'm not aware of uh, at this time. And now I get to buy these acreages, fully delineated. X Y Z. So um, I won't I won't talk about that too much. So here's what's happened in the last uh, two years. So CNRL has bought Penny Pony and Absolute Steel. Um, Arc and Seven Gens had merged. Conoco Phillips bought out Kelt after Kelt built out a gas plant. Uh, really good delineated acreage, liquids rich. Uh, Tourmaline has been very active. They bought a piece of Penny Pony. They bought Black Swan, Polar Star, Seguero, and Chinook. Uh, Chinook, another company that uh, delineated awesome acreage and then just got burnt by being so small. Same with all of these, Saguaro, Polar Star, Black Swan, same, same, same exact story. They couldn't make it in a $2 eco environment um, despite their phenomenal acreage. So this is kind of what's happening. A um, lot, lot of MA so far, more, more still to come. Um, you can see that there's this this company specifically, Kalama, has a land package way up here. And that's why when I was talking about make sure you're not at the end of the pipeline, some companies are at the end of the pipeline and are going to suffer um, from that. So, um, so there's a question here. As basins become well characterized, has corporate advantage um, moved from technical expertise to production? Yeah, for sure. For sure, like the technical expertise is for the most part done at this point. Now it's about who can produce the best, who can get the best uh, export routes for their gas, who can get the best deals on drilling and completions, who can get their pads built, who can have uh, contracts with the First Nations built so they can actually develop their properties, uh, who can make accretive acquisitions. Yes, it's becoming more of a corporate development game as opposed to a true engineering geology game which is now in the past, um, for the most part. There's still going to be continual uh, increases, but, but that's for the most part. This is what the acreage looks like. So when I say the Montney is not good for small companies, small companies can't afford to clear cut forests way in the bush and then run helos day in, day out, airlift drilling rig equipment in, build their own roads like this is this is big boy territory so just keep that in mind when when you're investing in these there are going to be junior monty names that pop up inevitable every cycle somebody thinks they can go and take a run at at some acreage way up north somewhere and uh, they're going to build their own sites and you know they can make it work in a hundred dollar oil environment hey kudos to you we we need more exploration people like that um, but the investors are not, not the, the table is not skewed toward the investor. There is a lot of money that doesn't go into drilling and completions that has to go in before you get any sort of property set up way in the bush. Um, yeah. And all these costs are going up because there is huge cost inflation for, for these sorts of services. Um, there's just not many of them left. And the ones that are left are already spoken for. Um, so yeah, another picture, this is the bush, literally. These are your, you know, some sort of either a drilling, well, not a drill, but looks like a frack going on here. And these are your water ponds. I'll talk about these water ponds later, but any company that has excess frack water pond capacity is uh, doing pretty well. Any company that has excess reservoir capacity as in they can pull fresh water from reservoirs is going to do quite well um, as Northeast BC is developed. So again, intangible stuff, it doesn't make or break companies, but it makes a difference to so their operating cost, their infrastructure cost, their processing cost, transportation, their drilling and completion cost. All of these things add up. When you're growing a company from 20,000 to 60,000 BOEs per day, all these things add up pretty majorly. And again, I'm not talking on a one well or a six month cycle. I'm talking over a three to five year development 
full-scale field development uh, cycle. Here's another picture of uh, kind of the Montney gas plants. So they are built in this modular fashion. So all the piping will be in one line and then you build modules around it as the gas plant capacity gets bigger. Very efficient, very effective, like uh, amazing planning that goes into this. You see here, the pipelines are coming out of the ground. Yeah, coming out of the ground right, right there, there's one, they come in. They go into your inlet separator right here. In the inlet separator, you, you take out condensate, water, oil, whatever, whatever wants to drop out. You then take it into a D-high unit, which will take out other uh, waters and um, any sort of uh, other contaminants in the, uh, in the unit. Then you put it into a refridge. And uh, what the refridge will do is drop out NGLs. It will drop out propanes, butanes, you can adjust the pressures and the temperatures in a refridge, uh, uh, depending on, um, I am recording, right? Yeah, uh, okay, great. Um, the the refridge unit can be, can be uh, changed depending on um, temperatures and pressures. If you wanna pull out more propane, you see, oh, like propane price is looking really good. You can adjust those things on the fly and get more NGLs or less NGLs. So, um, you might have heard your gas company saying we re-injected NGLs into the gas stream and all this. That's what they're trying to say, is that propanes and butanes weren't worth enough. So we just we just left the refridge plant go, and we just left the propane and but uh, butanes in the, in, uh, in the gas stream. And so the gas stream had a higher um, heat content. That being said, some pipelines will not allow you to do these sorts of things. So you have to have certain parameters uh, on the pipeline. And what happens after the refridge, you then compress the gas. So you, you take it from a low pressure, you get it to a high enough pressure to put it into the pipeline. Sometimes it could be up to 7, 8, 10, 15 MPA, megapascals. Uh, so you need a lot of compression horsepower. Sometimes there'll be multiple stages of compression. So you have your initial compression and then your secondary compression, uh, sometimes even a tertiary compression. We also have amine sweetening. So if you have sour gas, it has to run through an amine sweetening skid where it pulls the H2S hydrogen sulfide outside of the uh, gas stream. And then you can uh, sell your gas based on, again, the pipeline parameters. Some pipelines will not allow sour gas. Some will not allow a certain kind of water content or NGL content. And then you have a condensate stabilization. So the condensate that gets pulled out is very gassy. So the, the, the gas is oily, uh, very volatile, and the oil is gassy. So you have a specific condensate stabilizer where you leave the condensate, you let the gas flash off, and you put it back into your, your gas stream, and then your oil slash condensate goes into your oil tanks. Here is what a propane bullet looks like. Here's what an oil tank looks like. So all the black tanks are oil. The water tanks will usually be blue, but they can also be black uh, or white. And, and this is your propane bullet. So they keep propane at a very high uh, pressure in these bullets. And um, you might've seen driving down the road, those propane trucks that come in, they will take this propane uh, in its pressurized state and, um, uh, and sell it, sell it or, or take it to wherever it needs to go. So, um, very nice. You know, I, I love checking out new gas plants when they're freshly built. Um, have went to many of them just for my own curiosity. And uh, just, just cool to walk around and see state-of-the-art equipment, technology, automation, uh, ESG, emissions reduction, a lot, lot of cool stuff. Um, yes, yeah, Dirk, yeah. Yeah, a refridge is basically a crude, crude fractionation. I'm, I'm not going to pretend to be a refinery or a gas plant expert by any means. So this is just my understanding of it. But yes, the, the refridge plants, when you go in there, there, there's literally like icicles and snow, like that, that liquidy snow everywhere, because that's just the, the temperatures at which these things operate. Um, it's quite, it's, it's quite cool to see, um, you know, especially as an engineer, it's, it's just awesome. Uh, the kind of things that are out there um, yeah, here's a frack going on. 
looks like a Montney frac. So you have, uh, I think this is cow frac, given the green color on this coil tubing unit. And uh, all these pumpers will pump down uh, water. Uh, they'll keep pumping water down and keep fracking the formation at a very high pressure. And you can see the number of individuals it takes to run oil and gas operations. When we say there's a labor tightness, it's not one or two guys that are gonna come in and solve the labor tightness issue. Each frack needs 50, 75, 100 people. Each drilling rig needs 200 direct and indirect people. So there's a big group of people that makes this happen, um, you know, working out there. 24, these are 24, seven, three, six, five. There is no vacations. There's no birthdays. There's no Christmas. You, you work when you're called into work. And um, that's, that's just the way the oil industry works. We consume oil 24, seven, three, six, five. We need to produce oil 24, seven, three, six, five. One from Arc Resources here. Very cool, cool picture. Nice promotional uh, pick here. Nice little uh, plant site. A uh, little flare stack here on the end. And um, awesome, awesome territory. Awesome. Like it was absolutely a great working in these types of areas. Lots of wildlife. Um, as I discussed in my uh, a video, um, the video that I posted, the Wapiti uh, a run video on the ATV. Um, if you haven't checked that out, I, I basically have a, had a GoPro on my side by side when I used to operate. And I posted about an hour long video on my YouTube where I just talk about the different things as the video goes on. Um, the screen record didn't work properly for that, but um, you know, you still get the point as to as to what's happening. Um, these are called right of ways. So this is where the, the pipeline is buried. And most of the time they'll keep this very clean and clear cut because if there's ever a spill in the pipeline, you need very fast access to go uh, and check it out. You can also run electrical cables, um, Depending on what exactly you're trying to run, you can run Wi-Fi and uh, satellite, uh, um, what do you call it, fiber optics uh, through here. And most of the time it's just pipelines. So there'll be gas pipeline, oil pipeline. There could be a fuel gas that's coming in to feed the uh, site. Uh, but yeah, these are called right of ways. There's a road coming in and going out east. Or go, yeah, east on the picture. I, I don't know where exactly this is. Um, okay. So before we get into the company specific stuff, um, I just wanted to say again, for anybody on the Twitter that would like to join for the Zoom visuals, uh, whitetundra.ca, scroll to the bottom under events and uh, the Zoom link is there. Uh, you will have to input the uh, ID and password manually right now. There's something wrong that I will fix uh, for the next session. Uh, okay, so let's compare the US and, and Canada. So we have the you know, let's give the oil oil producers yeah, not a good comparison. We will go. Um, actually, let's let's keep the oil weighted producers. So about fifteen thousand dollars U.S. capital efficiency, which means for every barrel they bring online, they are paying about fifteen thousand U.S. Um, to bring that BOE online. Um, on the on the gas weighted side, you have somewhere about around seven thousand. Gas just comes on a lot stronger. Uh, keep in mind that the BOE of gas is worth a lot less than a BOE of oil. So naturally, we expect this to be lower. Um, the, the Canadian monthly producers are on a Canadian dollar basis, about 13,000. So, so quite, quite attractive, especially the liquids rich uh, monthly producers. They really compete uh, with these Permian Eagle for names. And then on the gas focus side, you know, tourmaline is your big one. Uh, Birchcliff, a little bit expensive. Uh, because their their DCET costs are a little bit higher, um, but but you know tourmaline doing really well comparing to EQ, uh, EQT, uh, Cotera and Entero, uh, really well. The the kind of the number to watch is this one here. Because the um, some of the U.S. names have have a little bit of a higher decline rate, uh, you can see they're spending more of their maintenance capital, uh, more of their cash flow on maintenance capital versus something like a tourmaline. So when we compare the blue chips, uh, the Canadian producers definitely have an advantage in terms of their decline rates and the near quality of their acreage. Uh, let's say on the oil side, relatively similar. Um, and the reason for that is that the Permian is about 90% oil. 
on their shale. The Montney oil is about 35 to 40% at max liquids. So naturally, um, this is a more high value product uh, that they're getting in the US. That's, that's their definite advantage. That's why the Permian got to 5 million barrels of oil production in seven or eight years. That's, that's literally the reason. It's because they found a shale that's 90% oil instead of 40, I call it 40% max uh, oil. So um, interesting comparisons. I'm not sure how much you can read into this, but uh, you can kind of see the um, change over the years. You can kind of compare between the two. Uh, I don't really want to make any strong statements based on this, da uh, this data because there's way, way more other stuff that should be taken into account uh, as well. Okay, so oil plays and natural gas plays half cycle payout period. Half cycle means we only look at the drilling, completion, equipment, and tie-in cost. Full cycle means we look at the company's GNA, we look at their interest cost, we look at what it costs them to buy the acreage, etc. So on a strictly half cycle period, after the clear water, it's all Montney. The Montney is very, very prolific, very economic. The well costs are way cheaper than the Permian um, and the Haynesville and the Marcellus, especially in Canadian dollars versus US dollars today. Um, we see that, that some of the uh, Permian Delaware stuff doesn't kick in until way down the list here. Um, and we're talking tier one stuff, uh, doesn't kick in till, till way down here. I'm gonna explain this in my US shale update next week, why, why the Canadian acreages are gonna make way more money, not just because the oil cycle is better, but also because they just are better producers, have better decline rates and are much cheaper. And, and I, I don't wanna get into this, but I'll, I'll talk about this uh, next week. So let's look at a half cycle payout period. Okay, one times payout. What does it cost to recover our DCET cost? At $50 a barrel US WTI, $2.50 MCF natural gas. The Canadian plays are at 1.5 years. It highlights their very low break even supply cost. The US shale gas plays are greater than six. It's that much different on the lower end of pricing. When we talk about $100 barrel oil and $5.50 gas, US. The Canadian ones are at 0.6, so 0 0.6 years for payout, half cycle payout. The gas plays are at one. So what we can conclude is that the gas plays in the US are much more torquey to higher gas pricing. So when gas pricing in the US can hit seven, eight, nine bucks as it did just a few months ago, the, the US shale gas plays are making a lot of money way more torque on the US gas plays, but they don't have the downside protection, not even close. Once prices go like below, um, call it $4 in MCF gas, the US shale plays really suffer. But let's, let's spice it up a bit. Um, two times half cycle payout. So when do they recover their costs, not just once, but twice? So if it costs you to DCET cost was 10 million, Effectively, what it's saying is, when do you make 20 million of net back? Because the Canadian gas plays have lower decline rates, when we look at a $75 per barrel, $4 MCF gas environment, about 2.8 years, median. The US is 7.5. So they pay out once, but because they've declined so much by that point, the second payout is just a three times as much longer. And even in a bullish environment, this holds true. At $100 uh, a US barrel WTI, at $5.50 gas US, 1.8 for the Monty, or for the Canadian natural gas plays. This is not just Monty, I should say. This is the Canadian natural gas plays. Everything is broken down. For anyone that's gonna be watching the recording, you can, you can play around with this um, kind of on your own. So 1.8 years, two times half cycle payout, at the bullish scenario, um, $100 WTI, $5.50 gas, the US shale plays are 3.9. The 
the U.S. shale plays don't make money. They really don't make money after they pay out. The, the Permian is very similar to the Marcellus and the Haynesville in terms of how much money did these producers actually make as they grew to 100 BCF per day? Not much. The Montney, as it grows, I mean, the numbers speak for themselves. I don't, I don't need to uh, keep saying the same thing uh, over and over. This is what we want. This is Delphi Energy that uh, went bankrupt or they got bought out, uh, can't exactly remember right now. If anybody knows people at these Montney producers, as an investor, this is what I want. Every single well, what's the length? What's the IP30? How many fracks? IP60 or IP90, IP180, IP270, IP365, and then IP730. If if you know somebody at a Monty producer, if you have a stake in a Monty producer, if you know somebody at IR, send them this, this chart and, and say, this needs to be in your corporate presentation. If you want your multiples to re-rate, if you want people to really know what your wells are doing, we need this for every single well in your corporate presentation or as an addendum um, sort of file. Because this is what investors are looking for. When they are in the Montney, there is so many different areas. There is so many different um, uh, uh, different kinds of like gas oil ratios, condensate oil ratios. It really simplifies things, especially the technically focused investors. They really want to know what is going on within your wells. Um, you can see how the Montney, some wells are really bad. Some wells are really good. And then you have these all these wells that are sort of the median average wells um, as well. And I believe Paramount is the only one that puts this right now in their corporate presentations. Uh, we want more of this. So if you're listening and you're, you work at a Montney producer, please make this happen. This will help investors. Uh, this will help you get more capital into your, your companies. It really transparently clarifies things. The one thing I would add, if you could, is the cost, the well cost per well. Put the well cost in. Let us run our own netbacks. Let me run my own type curve. You know, give me a chance to run my own, uh, you know, FCF calculation. Give me a chance to run my own production uh, estimate on on what's going to happen. Why are you doing it? Um, you know, and just and just throwing a graph on there, which may or may not be correct. It may be misleading. People don't believe you. You know, throw this in there. And I really want to stress this point because people keep asking me when when are companies going to re-rate? How come the multiple hasn't expanded? It's because people don't feel comfortable investing in, in oil and gas companies. They need more transparency. They need to know what's happening. And a large part of my efforts are, are towards that goal. And it would be good if the companies can support me on that by just posting transparent data. Um, all this data is already on Petro Ninja. I can already make it, you know, but not all investors have those um, you don't have the time, they don't have the softwares, they don't have the interest to do these things. Um, yeah, no, thank you, Dirk. Uh, the initial production rate measures how many, how much the production was for those rate, for those days. So the IP30 is the first 30 days. The IP365 is the first year, effectively. Here's some of the growth in the Montney. Um, you can see acreage, hammerhead. You can see the um, analog wells that are being drilled around it. This is CACWA right here. You can see how Hammerhead is developing their acreage. Um, most companies will develop where the pipelines and infrastructure is, the full-scale development, and then they'll have these delineation wells all across, uh, all across their acreage. Um, so, yeah. Um, I just want to show you the, the scale of how much we have developed. You see areas that are overdeveloped. Um, you see areas that are underdeveloped. Most of the asset is underdeveloped, just like this. Okay, so I showed you the US gas charts earlier. Up, two to three years peak, down. This is how the Montney producers are planning their production. 30 plus years of production at the peak. Is it going to happen? 
we don't exactly know yet because we're still trying to see how how much the degradation is in Kakwa and what the overall basin quality is to some extent. But yeah, this is doable. They can either produce 30 years at 60,000 BOEs or they can produce 10 years at 200,000 BOEs, right? Like that is a difference in the company's mindset in Canada. It's a difference in the company's mindset overall in the oil and gas sector. And it's artificially forced upon these companies because they don't have the export capacity to process all this gas. Fantastic. Um, once again, make sure where your companies are in this, in this zones. Are they in the lean gas, dry gas? Are they in the oil rich liquids? Um, are they outside the hydrocarbon charging area? And what's the pressure uh, regime? Is it under pressured, normally pressured, or over pressured? So you can see past this line, it gets into an over pressured zone, which is what causes the condensate and oil to become NGLs and, and more of like a volatile, um, even more volatile oil. The more pressure, the more you uh, constrict this, the, this oil. Uh, the more it becomes kind of like a gassier zone, per se. This is great. So companies have started doing this, I see. They start putting the well averages, the pad totals, the breakdowns. Move it to what Delphi was doing. Start putting IP30s, IP60s, IP365s. I also like this, this uh, table. It shows you what they drilled, how many wells, where it is, when it came on stream, the payback period, and where are they currently drilling? This is, this is what we need. We need this level of transparency. So kudos to Hammerhead. They're going public in February. They know what the investor wants. They're going on the NASDAQ. They have pre-planned all of this. Very smart. Very, very smart. If you're an opaque management team that wants to keep your secrets, you want to uh, you know, not let people find out what's happening. You don't want to make things clear. All the power to you. People are just going to stop investing uh, in companies like that um, when other companies are putting out all this data. Okay. Um, the other thing to keep in mind with your companies is where are they? Are they close to the major gas plants? Here, for example, um, Hammerhead is very close to the uh, energy transfer uh, Patterson Creek gas plant, the CNRL car gas plant, they're close to an oil terminal. They have other sales capacity, the Gold Creek gas plant. You want more options. If you're a motley producer, and I'll talk about this a little bit later on, if one of these gas plants goes down for any reason, you're stuck. You can't produce gas, you can't produce oil, you can't produce condensate. Bad. So it's good to have more options in your area where you can send gas, send oil, um, you know, this company's done a really good job. And I'm not, I'm not saying go invest in Hammerhead. I'm just sharing that they've done a really good job um, at positioning themselves to where they have. Uh, export pipelines also keep this in mind. We have the Amalin here, which is a very uh, lucrative base in Oregon and Washington um, and California. We have Chicago and then Dawn that goes out east into the Toronto area. Each have their own pricing. And I'll share more here uh, as I kind of go on. Uh, but but the more pipeline routes you have, the more you can take advantage of pricing power in certain hubs, um, especially places like California. Um, yeah, and, and Washington State, and then the LNG terminals on the Gulf Coast and Canada for that matter. Okay, so now we have uh, Paramount. Um, Here's a type curve on Paramount. You can see how the type curve is a mixture of the best wells and the worst wells and the medium wells. This is why it's very difficult for a small company to make it in the monthly because you might hit two or three of these lower quality wells. There's your company gone right there. If you just blew $30 million um, on just the wells, you might've blown another 100 million building your infrastructure, maybe more and now you don't have the money. This is what took a lot of companies under in 2016, 2017, 18, 19, 20. Um, so when we say type curve, there's good wells and there's bad wells and there's medium wells. So a type curve is, is only generated after various drilling um, 
and production has come through. So just keep that in mind. If you're investing in a company with one or two or three well programmed, the type curve goes right out the window. It, it doesn't really mean much um, because you could hit a really good well, you could hit a really bad well. Um, you, you're not gonna hit the, exactly the medium well. Look how many wells in this, in this chart are exactly the medium well, 5% less. Um, so, um, yeah, so, and then they share with you your sort of type curve information. This is a cool chart that uh, Paramount has. It tells you the well cost and then how many times wells have paid out. So you can see how as the well costs are come down, the per well payout, how many times the well pays out over its life has gone way higher. Um, I don't like them estimating this because they're effectively telling you what the well is gonna make over like a 40 to 60 year time frame. Um, not quite relevant. Maybe they should they should turn down their EUR to show the next 10 years, let's say, or the next five years, as opposed to like, oh yeah, this well will produce till 2065. And we're just gonna tell you how much net back it's gonna generate. A, a, a tiny bit misleading, although accurate, tiny bit misleading. Still kudos to them for, for sharing this. Um, they, they did the same for their Wapiti wells. You can see how the type curve has adjusted up here because they were initially drilling really bad or lower quality wells. And now they've really um, fixed up their Wapiti drilling such that the type curve can actually be adjusted up um, based on the most recent drills. So um, really good job once again, sharing all the information. They're sharing what the wells cost. Um, they're sharing how much money they've made off each single well so far. Paramount has been one of the top performers from 2020, the lows of 2020, along with management strength, transparency. Transparency, tell us what's happening. I don't want to be caught off guard with random stuff that uh, was not well uh, disseminated before the fact. Costs, keep an eye out on this. Completion costs have been going down for years, years five, six, seven years. Now they've ticked back up. Well costs are gonna go back up. This is not an opinion, this is a fact. Well costs are gonna go back up. Sometimes 10, 15, 20, 30% in certain cases. So as you're running your models, um, we already see this in the CapEx that's been increased in certain names, but there's gonna be further increases and, and keep a close eye on the, the well internal rates of return. Some wells are very sensitive to increases um, in the DCET cost, some wells are not. So watch the cost, just watch the cost. Watch which companies are able to keep their costs low versus which companies are really getting affected. Another reason why small companies are at a disadvantage when they can't sign up for a 10, 20 well drilling program or a 10, 20 well frack, you're paying top dollar um, to mobilize that unit bring it in. The company wants more money because they got to deal with your, um, you know, your sites and, and all that for only one or two um, jobs. Once again, transparency, excellent job by Paramount. They show every single well, what it's making, peak 30 day, and what it's made cumulative. I would like to see still the IP90s and the IP365, but this is a great, fantastic start. Um, really gives me insight into what's happening. Uh, you can see how the Wapiti wells are relatively cookie cutter in terms of production. You can see how the car wells, some are good, some are bad, uh, some are neutral, medium. Goes through your, your type curve, very similar, right? Very similar, the way they make these type curves is off that, the consistency of your top well results. Um, okay, so we're, we're about two hours in, so um, I think I have about 10 or 15 more slides to go, so we'll finish that up. We'll do a little Q&A session, and uh, maybe we'll, we'll call it there uh, without having to take a break here. So Tourmaline, huge acreage, lots of undeveloped acreage. They own lots of gas plants. There's a reason this is a blue chip of the blue chips. They have control over almost everything here. Reserves, I'd mentioned this earlier. As they start to delineate more of the undeveloped acreage, 
the reserves are going to go up substantially. We know the, the resource is there. It just hasn't translated it into reserve because they haven't drilled a well right next to it. So as, as the companies develop, as they delineate, the reserves are going to go up very substantially, very, very substantially, which then comes into net asset value, which is then further uh, can be increased by higher oil pricing, uh, oil, oil and gas pricing. Here's Formalines Wells. Um, you can kind of see the internal rates of return here um, and how many future development locations they have. This is the big boss, along with CNRL as well. Uh, but, but CNRL has other things going on. So the gas portion of their business is relatively small as part of the company compared to a tourmaline um, where the gas is their business for the most part, um, along with the Charlie Lake and the Conroy and all that um, oil-focused stuff, uh, Wapiti call it. So looking really good. Um, you know, can't, can't say much wrong about tourmaline. It's... Uh, very well managed, very well run, very well executed company. Look for companies with LNG supply agreements like Tourmaline and ARC. 15 year supply agreements selling at JKM 140 MCF per day. JKM is currently trading at about $20 US and MMBTU plus. So you're taking gas that's worth $3 Canadian, ACO $4, $5 Canadian, you're now selling it at $20 US, pretty substantial. So something to incorporate into your models for sure, um, especially with the big producers, it can make a massive impact. Owning facilities, always check how many facilities does your uh, investment company own? Not just because they save on processing, they save on transportation, they get to control their own destiny, but because the plants are worth a lot of money. ARC has about, call it 1.5 BCF of processing capacity, maybe more, 1.5, 1.6. That's worth about $2 billion plus in facilities and infrastructure. Nobody ever talks about this. When they, when they start running models on cash flow, they start running models on net asset value. There's a lot of inbuilt infrastructure um, infrastructure upside that is, is not really uh, shown in the uh, stock prices. So once again, all, all of this changes over time. It changes as more people believe we're in a bullish oil cycle, oil and gas cycle. Um, none of this is gonna happen overnight. This is gonna happen as time goes on. Um, you know, People ask, how did oil and gas companies start getting valued at 12 times cash flow in 2012? They weren't exactly getting valued at 12 times cash flow. They, they, there was an inbuilt, um, inbuilt upside from the infrastructure, from the pipelines, from the roads, from the undeveloped acreage, from the acreage that did have reserves associated with it. So when you take all that out, they, they weren't really trading at 12 times cash flow. They were maybe trading at six or eight times cash flow. So we are going to get back there. We, we are going to get back to these things. It takes time. It takes people believing in the cycle. It takes the companies generating a lot of cash, um, getting rid of their debt, um, and just more investors looking for uh, opportunities to beat the risk-free rate. Supply demand, you can see, we're not building that much pipeline capacity, export capacity in Canada. Uh, by 2026, we're adding, call it, three to four BCF per day. Not, not enough to really crush uh, Western Canadian gas pricing. So, um, you know, it's going to be slow growth, a, a slower growth, call it basin, than some of the U.S. basins. Once again, something that I really like, rather than companies going crazy and just overcapitalizing everything. ARC also has Attachee West, uh, completely undeveloped. It's 200,000 acres. And they only have 5 million BOEs of, uh, of reserves associated with this. Again, I, I keep saying the same thing I know, but, but in the Montney, the undeveloped reserve value is not being reflected in, in most of these names. As they develop these, as they delineate these, you're going to see the reserves value start to skyrocket up um, as, they, as the reserves uh, 
evaluators give them credit for this. We already know this is Montney. There are wells here that are making oil and gas. There are wells here that are making oil and gas. There are wells here and here. Unless there's a huge geologic unconformity that just appeared out of nowhere and the 3D seismics are fake, I mean, there would have to be some serious fraudulent uh, issues or a serious geologic uh, problem for, for me to say that there, this isn't Montney. Um, and it's not going to be as productive as whatever's around it. But the reserve evaluator will not give you credit for it until you drill. So people saying that, oh, companies are trading at their, you know, 60% of the reserve value. Try and run it. What are they, what are they being valued on a resource value? Again, this is where savvy investors can make a lot of money by, by pre kind of front running these things happening. Um, and why I choose to kind of allocate my dollars in the Montney in, in specific names that, that have this upside um, as opposed to other names that have already delineated um, their packages. Um, yeah, so I'll get to these questions here at the end um, as well, Michael. Uh, so, but yeah, thanks for asking. I, I will get to it. Um, here's your Tachi phase one, as you know, about a three year uh, cash capital commitment. At that point, it can probably flow for 20 to 30 years, um, making a pretty relative, uh, relatively nice net back. And keep in mind, this is at $65 WTI and $475 US gas. If oil goes higher or if gas goes higher, your net back, your torque increases. Here's my problem with Arc Resources, why I, I sold this company in June. Um, Rystat sent me this information in about April or May. Top wells by BOEs per day. 2017 drills, 4,000 plus. 2019 drills, 3,200 was the top well. And you can see the bottom has kind of fallen out of the top 10 compared to here. By 2021, the top well drilled by Arc Resources uh, slash seven gens in 2021 in the Cacwell Montney wouldn't even have made the top 10 of 2017. Degrading acreage, I bail. I'm very against the Permian. I'm very against Eagleford. I'm very against the Bakken, Marcellus, Haynesville. All these shale plays that are seen degrading acreage. There's a huge cost component to this when cost, when we're in a cost inflationary environment. When your drilling and completion costs are going up and your wealth productivity is going down, double whammy impact. Why bother? When there's other companies that have um fresh acreage with increasing productivity, why own these names? My, that's my investment thesis. This is not investment advice. That's the way I choose to allocate my dollars. And that's why we're waiting for Arc Resources to FID their prolific Attachee, because Attachee is fresh, as I talked about. Huge acreage, not, not that much reserves yet, and they can grow production massively here and keep it sustained for a huge period of time. So waiting on that, it's a huge catalyst for Arc. And in the meantime, the capital wells are still better than a lot of liquids rich wells that are in the area. So the Kakwa car acreage is probably the top acreage in the area um, in terms of oil, liquids production and gas production. So don't, don't take this as a, as a sign that ARC's acreage is much worse. It, it has degraded from a like top 1% acreage to a top 10% acreage. At the same time, there's other companies that are drilling poor quality wells on their sort of top acreage. So um, there's a reason Seven Gens was able to grow as fast as it did. And there's a reason that um, ARC wanted this, this asset specifically, um, as opposed to some of the other Montney that's, that's, that's undeveloped, because this is a cash flow machine. All the gas plants are already built. All the infrastructure is already there. So still a phenomenal acreage. Um, that that still has a lot of runway. Um, I'll put it that way. Okay, um, this is uh, Advantage Oil, AAV. You can see the well productivities are increasing substantially, massive. From 2020 to 2022, we see about a 40% increase uh, in well productivity. Amazing. Um, they're also growing their processing revenue. So owning gas plants, you not only decrease your own internal cost, you can process other people's gas and make money off it. 
So um, if you're in the Montney, if, you're, uh, if your investment company owns their own processing equipment, watch for this to become kind of a, a bigger thing as time goes on, uh, especially companies that can expand their gas plants and have that room. Now, this is something to be very careful of. We see here producing days versus cumulative BOEs. And they have their five different areas labeled on this. Any investor looking at this would say, oh, the Wembley D3 oil is not looking that good. Whereas the Glacier Upper Gas is looking, uh, you know, solid. Wrong. So because the Wembley D3 is an oil asset versus the other ones are a gas asset, the MBOE, barrel of oil equivalent of oil, is worth way more, which means this bottom line is actually your best paying payout well. I don't know why they've put this slide in here like this, but when, when you're seeing type curves, try, try to break them down into gas and oil separate, um, because this is a completely misleading slide. And I think people are not, not going to fully understand this unless they know the difference or they look at this table specifically. Um, so, so just keep that in mind. The Montney has gas, oil, condensate, volatile oil, rich gas, dry gas. You can't just run a type curve on BOEs and start comparing things. Um, I still appreciate the effort. I like this. I like this graph. I like that they've given me all fit on the same graph. But it would be nice if they broke it down um, into gas and oil uh, as well. So here's your here's your uh, torque upside torque on uh, on half cycle economics. You can see how the internal rates of return just just become almost nonsensical if you run if you start running things at like six dollar a call hundred dollar oil. Your internal rates of return go go up to like three four five hundred percent, and the NPVs become similarly astronomical. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, um, okay, so the next thing we have is uh, we are going to be looking at where are your companies selling gas to? Are they selling into ACO, Don, Sumas, Malin, Henry Hub, Alliance, LNG, uh, etc.? So. One sec here. So why is this important? And why, why do I focus on this? Because most companies will only tell you what their benchmark pricing was, as in what price they got in that specific, um, call it hub. We need to break it down to what the net back was. So if you're sending gas from Alberta all the way to Chicago, it's going to cost you. You're going to pay $1.25 transportation cost. So if you're running modeling around gas price sensitivities, around uh, how much money they're making at each hub, always take into account the processing, the transportation, and the fuel cost to get, to get your gas from there to there, or from there to there. And you may end up finding out that even if ACO is a dollar cheaper than Dawn or Henry Hub, it might have made more sense to sell into ACO because you're not having to ship the gas all the way. Um, so. People get confused about this all the time. They say, oh, the Dawn and Henry Hub is always more than ACO. You know, uh, how come we don't just send everything into Henry Hub? Well, because it costs you $1.57 uh, differential. It costs you 31 cents of transportation. There's other factors involved um, in doing that. Uh, okay. Thanks, Derek. I, I really appreciate this. I'm, uh, I, I think people are, uh, are really... Uh, wanting to hijack these spaces uh, today. So uh, uh, appreciate your uh, help. Oh yeah, I was also gonna share this. So I was talking about the frack water ponds earlier. So here Birchcliff has about 50,000, uh, or um, Birchcliff has enough water storage and infrastructure that they've taken 50,000 trucks off the road since 2017, uh, better for their DCET cost. It's better for their just overall uh, emissions reduction and ease of, op of operations. This other statement 
Berkeley's liability management rating is 17.27 compared to an industry average of 5.23. Your liability management rating is effectively your assets over your liabilities, your deemed assets divided by your deemed liabilities. Burst Club is saying that their liability management rating is 17. They also have very low break-even supply cost. So why have I never looked at Burst Club as an investment? Because if your liability management rating is so good and your break-even supply cost is so good, why are you so focused on being debt-free? Like why, why is that your goal? You, you have the safety nets already that you don't have ARO, you have really good wells, you have pretty low supply cost, your dividend is not outrageous. Why are all these companies wanting to go debt free? And I know I'm gonna be swimming against, against the sort of uh, 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 the wave or the flow here, but I like management teams that can comfortably run a company with a bit of debt with a little bit of a hard debt component to it that shows me that you are good at managing the company. You can actually generate value for me using financial leverage. If you want to run a no debt company, you effectively give it up. You're just saying, I don't want to take any risk. And sure, a lot of investors are happy with that. They want you to have no debt. Um, that way they feel safe from any bankruptcies and all this. Um, but I'm just giving you my investment opinion. I like management teams that are comfortable and uh, you know, competent with running a little bit of debt and they, they can uh, effectively manage the company through that and through the cycle as it kind of continues. Um, of course, this has given my bullish outlook on oil and gas, um, but financial leverage makes a huge difference to your share price performance over a prolonged bull market scenario. A massive difference. It's It's not even close. It's not even in the same ballpark. Um, if you're running a little bit of financial leverage, if you're running more financial leverage and the commodity price cycle is good, you're going to vastly outperform your no debt peers. Um, so anyway, uh, I don't want to keep talking about that, but uh, just something I wanted to share uh, from my own investment uh, sort of thinking. And that comes from somebody who's never run an, an oil and gas company. I'm just saying as an investor in these companies, um, that's what I look for. And you can see my portfolio reflects that. So again, if you're investing in Birch Club today, you're paying for about 20 years of delineation that's already been done. You're paying for 20 years of growth that other investors have taken the risk on uh, of doing this. And we're buying companies now that are in their field, full field development phase. Um, not a lot of opportunities like this usually out there because by the time we get here, these companies are so overvalued that uh, it, it doesn't even make sense to invest in them as you saw in the tech space uh, over the last few years. So, um, yeah, uh, okay. Burst Cliff's risk is that they're totally unhedged. Um, it's, a fair, it's a fair point, but uh, I can talk about this another time, but, uh, yeah, I don't think like being being unhedged is uh, specifically a a risk per se. Um, you know, you you're running a company, you need to have an outlook on the macro cycle. If you're just if you're just running willy nilly, mm, may not be the best way to run these companies. But uh, hey, I'm speaking as somebody who's never run an ENP, so uh, take everything with a grain of salt. I speak as an investor uh, only at this point. So. Um, there's a question here on what's my preferred debt to equity ratio. I'd say something like a 25% debt and 75% equity um, should be able to be ran uh, with a lot of corporations. I'm not, I'm not advocating for, for a 50-50 split, uh, but, but something like that I think is, is pretty reasonable um, in my perspective. If I'm paying management hundreds of thousands of dollars and millions of dollars in share options on top of that, um, you've got to provide value. So here, once again, we see drilling costs going up. We see total costs going up. Uh, New Vista is saying 2023, it's gonna go up further. So they are comfortable putting this out uh, already. 
Um, we know from previous uh, experience that the inflation in 2022 came in the second half. Uh, I believe the number that was given to me somewhere was 7% inflation in, in, uh, in, in the first half and 18% inflation in the second half. So the fact that New Vista is only putting a very low safety net here, I guess we'll see how, uh, how, uh, how true this was or, or how accurate this was uh, when we get there. Uh, at the same time, they've done really good at filling up their gas plants. So I've spoken about this in other companies where they have half, half filled infrastructure or low filled infrastructure. As you fill that infrastructure through production growth, your operating cost goes down. And that is effectively the same as the oil price going up. So when they brought their OPEX down from $20 of BOE to about 15, they're generating the same extra margin as oil price going from 70 to 75 or 90 to 95. Uh, the GAG emissions, I, I do want to mention this because there's a lot of uh, BS out there that uh, oil companies are polluters and they just you know dump stuff everywhere. Um, I can tell you for a fact in Canada, the companies themselves are beating all the AER requirements and uh, most of the other requirements that come in, they're already there. So companies themselves do a very good job at uh, reducing emissions, reducing frack water, dumping, uh, reducing spills, and, and having lots of automation and uh, kind of control as to what happens um, in their fields. Um, you know, before the regulate before the regulator has to step in and 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 force things as it is in some parts of the US and worldwide. The Montney supply demand is always going to look good uh, because the oil sands and heavy production looks to be continued to, to rise at about a three to four or five percent rate per year. And we need to dilute it. And therefore we always need the Western Canadian condensate which comes primarily from the Montney and the Duvernay. So in that way, they're producing a very high value liquids that trades at one to $2, sometimes up to $5 above WTI, and that's US dollars. So a pretty good liquid stream um, that, that, that they have, uh, that they're selling into. Here is one of New Vista's pads, I believe. You can see the, the modular design uh, with, the, with the modular, uh, call it, Inlets or refrigerators or dehydes. You can see the tanks, flare stack. Um, you know, neat, neat little pad here. Uh, pretty well built. Oventive. So Oventive has done some really good uh, execution in terms of drilling speed, laterals, sand efficiency, faster completions, and they have the top wells. So they have the top wells in uh, Alberta slash BC in terms of gas production. Some of them making over forty million of gas. Um, I think this is first month rate uh, is what it's giving you. Yeah. So just to put that in, uh, into perspective, 40 million of gas is 6,000 BOEs per day out of one well. So very nice. And that's really where a lot of the productivity gains have helped companies like Oventiv, um just destroy their competition because of where they are in the basin, um, as well as the top, uh, some of the top cumulative gas wells as well uh, belong to uh, Oventive. Look how, how much better their top well is from the second best well. Almost 60 to 70% better. So um, doing really good stuff. They are declining a bit in terms of their liquids yields and um, some of their production numbers don't seem to be increasing, which makes me think there's a very high decline rate. Uh, but I don't really look at Oventive that much in detail. But when you look at companies with top wells, always look at their IP365 as well. So you get an idea as to are they overproducing these wells right off the bat to get really good rates, and then the declines are 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 a bit too high uh, compared to their peers. Spartan Delta, so they have a different kind of map. They show you the actual windows, oil, volatile oil, wet gas, dry gas. Um, you know you can overlay your company's acreage on this and see where they are. You can see they have some interesting delineation acreage down here. When you run it here, very few wells have been drilled in this area. Same with Flat Rock, where, where a Kelt also is. So if these areas can get delineated, another massive boost to reserves 
uh, and land value. So you can see Capua right here. You can see kind of some of the, the birch cliff development, um, Shell uh, and Canna, um, or sorry, Obintu. And then you can see how Spartan Delta has mostly fresh acreage. And uh, you know, one of the reasons I wrote my Seeking Alpha on them was, was exactly this. Um, and they ended up being the top performer in 2022 in terms of share price appreci appreciation. So, um, you know, figuring these things out up front and front running the stock, like as in buying it early before the market realizes the, these things is really what, what's going to generate uh, alpha. And a lot of these things are public. They're publicly available. There's nothing that's hiding. You, you don't have to talk to management. It's pretty obvious that Spartan Delta's acreage is um, quite undrilled. Uh, and and pretty much in the core of the Montney, uh, for the most part, especially this Gold Creek stuff, which is really good, and has some of those um, natural fractures that I've talked about. You can see how they're completely destroying their type curve. This is a very strong engineering and management team, and I will just go a little bit into detail as to why. Because Spartan Delta has all this acreage, I mentioned earlier, companies with a lot of acreage can afford to widen their spacing. That's exactly what they did. You see this dark green line is 270 meter spacing instead of the 180 and 230 meter spacing, meaning 270 meters between wells as opposed to less. That is gonna drive each well's productivity much higher. You can see how they are absolutely demolished the type curve. And I expect to see this continual growth um, and outperformance going forward. It's one of the reasons why Spartan Delta's uh, production estimates are completely fake. They themselves uh, are completely sandbag what they're going to produce. So, um, you know, in in my uh, call it eight times free cash flow model, I have a huge increase in in Spartan Delta production baked in compared to something like a Pipestone or a um, you know whatever the the other companies in the area. I'll say. Um, and you can see that, yeah, the oil rate speeding and the gas rate is way higher, way, way higher than um, than these older wells at lower spacing. And this is all public. They, they put this in their corporate presentation. Um, not, not much work has to be done to figure out which companies are going to outperform their peers within a specific kind of basin. Here's Pipestone. They're also in the kind of high condensate oil fairway, relatively undrilled acreage. You can see they're drilling to the west because that's where the pipelines and infrastructure is. Um, you know, And you can see a lot of the activity has been in this uh, a belt per se, including seven gens Capua and why it was so good, just so good uh, and economic. Um, a little bit more on Pipestone. We see the Western development. We see some delineation work going on here. Watch this to show up in reserves. So as they drill this well, they can now get some uh, benefit of reserves around this well. And um, you know here as well, and as well as on the east side, you can see how they say CGR on the west, which is condensate gas ratio. On the east, it becomes OGR, oil gas ratio. So. We see there's a there's a defined line here where they've they've gone from a condensate rich oil, uh, a condensate rich gas to like a more of an oil rich uh, gas. The new well that everybody was fretting on about about the H2S content um, was a really good well. So not not really sure what the concern is. Um, the the CGR is a little bit lower than the other parts of the uh, I call it pipestone acreage, but it's nothing out of the ordinary or out of the norm by any means. Uh, H2S content uh, can be dealt with. Uh, it's not a big deal. Um, you, yes, you have to install amine uh, skids. Yes, you may, might need H2S scrubbers on site. Yes, you might need to batch with, with biocide. Big deal. It's a, it's a minutia thing uh, when you have this much acreage that you just delineated and, and show that there's Montney upside here. Um, the other thing is H2S doesn't just come from natural reasons. You could have introduced H2S in the formation by using uh, contaminated frac water. You could have uh, 
let let something settle there and the bacteria just eats up the oil and creates hydrogen sulfide. So by no means is it a company breaker or anything. Um, just my opinion, I did not invest in Pipestone because I'm not a fan of the management team. Uh, but on the overall, the, the geology looks great. And I, I don't see any sort of engineering issues um, at this point. Um, yeah, so, so the reason I sold Spartan Delta was because I was quite confident that Spartan Delta was uh, lining up for an acquisition back when I sold it, uh, call it mid-year last year. And um, they, they did not end up making an acquisition. But of, of course, they recently just said, we are open to uh, mergers and selling ourselves and all this. So um, that was my indication from, from my conversations with management was that they were you know, looking to kind of prove this thing out and then either build or sell. And I just didn't want to be involved in, in that sort of thing. And at this point, Spartan Delta has vastly outperformed their peers. So I see, um, you know, I see other opportunities that are just relatively more attractive to me. Um, Kelt, so nice little land package. And I would once again focus on the type curves. So, so this one is much lower IP rates, but you can see it's 57% oil versus the Pousse Coupe is much higher IP rates, BOEs per day, but it's 90% gas. So just, just keep these in mind. Where is your company's acreage? What is the liquids ratios along with the IPs? And kind of run your own, own netbacks on it. Like say gas is worth $20 a BOE and oil is worth $80 a BOE. And then you get a better comparison, apples to apples, between the different Montney acreages. Um, as well, you can compare it to other areas, like, like the Spirit River, uh, Lower Charlie Lake uh, area. Montney stack, according to Kelt, you once again see what we were showing as you go from BC to Alberta. The upper Montney cuts out completely, and you get the middle and lower Montney um, kind of becoming your main, main zones of production uh, over here. So uh, yeah, this is showing porosity, I believe, again, uh, on these on these uh, charts. A little bit more about the work that's been done in the Montney since 2011. You can see the, the geologic modeling as far as liquids and gas, very, very good modeling already out there on the entire formation. As well, when Kalama first started in 2011, they were outside the known Montney area. Over the next four to, four to six years, that area became part of the Montney. So there's still being work being done on going outside and trying to find the edge of the formation. But why should companies? They've got so much acreage within their own area, they'll just keep producing that. And then as, as the time comes, they'll do a bit of exploratory drilling. But it's mostly the smaller producers that are, that are doing this, the Celts and Spartan Deltas of the world, and uh, you know, trying to hit another big Montney area. But for the most part, uh, not, not too much going on in terms of extending the Montney boundaries uh, at this point. We also get the advantage of the old vertical wells that were drilled way earlier. So just to go into the history a bit, I mean, this is, this is a decades, decades of work that we're buying today. Uh, we see uh, Blackbird and Delphi and what they were testing. Um, you know, you can see there's a well here, 230 BOEs per day, and there's a well right next to it, two miles, you know, mile away, 8,000 BOEs per day. So, you know, there's a lot of work that's gone into this, the proper well trajectory, the proper well spacing, the proper completions, drilling, and um, a lot of stuff going into this, this sort of fresh acreage um, and the scale of the acreage that we have in the Montney. Uh, here's a little bit more about that uh, on the geology, the underlying Leduc reefs, the Kakwa work, and uh, wells that used to take 60 days to drill one mile. Now you can drill them in less than a month and you can drill three miles in less than a month. So, you know, the, the DCET cost that investors are facing is a lot lower. Of course, all the extra money comes to us. Um, so this is one of the, one of the things that I, I kind of think about a little bit is that when people talk about service, uh, services making a lot of money, um, 
sure, sure, they can make a lot of money and their margins will go up and they're going to have more activity. But like Frax used to cost 15 million. Now they cost 4 million. So, you know, you can just, just think about that. The revenue on that one Frax fleet has gone from making 15 million to 4 million. And sure, the jobs are faster. So, so you're not stuck of that long. But costs itself have come down significantly. Um, and, and one of the things that more and more of the activity is in these unconventional shales, Montney, Duvernay, et cetera. And they have just become so efficient at cost cutting their DCET that uh, I'm not sure how much they'd be willing to pay as, as costs inflate. Would they just start cutting their um, sort of growth targets as opposed to paying way more for DCET? Water pits. So this is, um, uh, which, which company is this? Yeah, I'm not even sure which company I pulled up here, but um, companies that own, own freshwater pits, I talked about this earlier, a regular frac is about 20 to 25 to 30,000 cubic meters of water. If you have the freshwater pits, you can not only use them and save yourself some money, but you can also sell that water to producers that don't have access to fresh water. So it's a nice little bonus um, stream that they can get. Uh, oh yeah, Black Swan, it says right there. This is from, from the Black Swan uh, corporate presentation, which is now, of course, owned by Tourmaline. And you once again see, see the progress slash Patronus development. They delineated the entire thing, and then they started doing their full-scale field development um, over here. Same, same down here. Um, okay, I think we have two or three more slides left. So this is something, the well trajectory that has changed over the last few years. Producers used to drill flat wells, but now they've figured out if you drill it this way, your liquids will gravity feed kind of into the closer to where the well bore is, um, where the, the heel of the well is. So something that's changed over the last little bit likely has resulted in very good productivity on liquids and gas because liquids used to get stuck in certain places and kind of freeze out some of the frac stages. Uh, so very good. This is what it looks like. So as you can see, uh, the Monty is not a true shale. It's a sand siltstone uh, reservoir. You can see the streaks of oil and then the gas, gas is kind of commingled in here uh, with pretty Decent porosity here looks like way more than 5%. But uh, yeah, again, I'm not a geologist. I'm still learning a lot of um, geology stuff as I go. Um, they're pretty interesting stuff and very vital to knowing some of these companies and what they're doing. So, you know, of course, you can see kind of the, the, the corpsey look that it has. And the last thing to focus on is shutdowns. So I said this earlier is that when when you're producing in the Montney, you need gas processing capacity. And we have multiple companies now have trouble and have really bad production numbers because their gas processing went down. And um, most of the companies that are having this problem are ones that send gas third party. So Kelt, Paramount, um, you know, kind of the two big ones, Pipestone Energy as well, where the um, there are outages at Kirawapiti and, and all these issues. So having companies that own their own infrastructure and do the maintenance on it regularly, because they know if they don't do maintenance on the gas plant, their entire production stream could go down, um, is, is I think going to become a bigger factor going forward, especially as the Montney gets more production and things get squeezed, compressors are running full bore, and... Um, you just don't have that safety net anymore that maybe you used to three, four, five years ago. So, uh, you know, one of the things to really focus on, sure, it costs more money to build these things out because you yourself have to put up the cash as opposed to a third party. But um, I'll just put it this way. There, there's companies already out there that have already built gas plants and processing and infrastructure. They've already put the money in and they control their own destiny. You know, I mentioned Arc Resources earlier. There's there's other companies that are smaller that have that same flexibility and control. And I think they're just going to have better production numbers going forward. And they also own the gas plants, which is, again, um, not being reflected in the share prices just quite yet. So with that, I think um, to wrap it up, 
uh, once again, really appreciate everybody joining in and the patience with uh, my little uh, delay last week. So I uh, appreciate that. And um, for anyone that joined late, the recording will be on YouTube here shortly, probably in the next three or four hours. Um, this this uh, this new laptop I bought actually got uh, 4K on it. So I've been really liking the quality that uh, it's been putting out. So um, yeah, I think uh, once again, I think uh, my my email and my DMs are always open for people that are having any suggestions as to future presentations or seminars. This Motney session was suggested to me uh, by somebody else as well, along with some of the other ones that I'm holding uh, in the first two or three months of the year. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I will be updating my portfolio, call, uh, call it midweek, um, mid or late this week. And um, you know, look forward to discussing some of the changes in uh, maybe one of the Twitter spaces or in next week's uh, Q&A session. And uh, yeah, it's been it's been a hell of a 2022 for for oil investors. Um, you know, we had the the initial start to the year, then we had the June highs, then we had a drawdown. At the same time, people who maybe didn't buy in in 2021 maybe got an opportunity to to buy in at at pretty good pricing. Uh, equity pricing in the latter part of last year. And uh, now we go into 2023 with um, some you know, interesting companies out there. They have uh, got a year of really good cash flow and free cash flow. And uh, kind of looking forward to see how this cycle goes. And uh, I really want to make make one, one point is that, and I said this at the beginning of the presentation, is that oil companies are, are not, are not, you know, like a typical business that, okay, I'm going to open a coffee shop. I can open it in six months. Like, it's not like that. There, there's an iterative process to it. And there's volatility around that. There is obviously the macro cycle that 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 dictates a lot of things as to what the companies can do. But, um, you know, going out and taking victory laps both ways, either you made money or you, um, you know, you're you're making fun of the people that that didn't sell in June or whatever. Victory lapping both ways over a six month period um, is doesn't really mean anything. You're just wasting your time, to be honest. Um, especially because a lot of these companies have gone through a six or seven year down cycle, so they're very hesitant to really go out and and do a lot of money spending projects. They're hesitant to capitalize their projects. They're still some of them are still paying off debt before they can go in and really show the world what their acreage is worth. So. There's definitely a timeline component to this that is often ignored. And um, you know, at the end of the day, it's it's whether you have that sort of investment timeline or not, because um, it's gonna take time. Uh, nothing in here is gonna be done overnight, especially in a high inflation, uh, high supply chain issue environment. Everything is gonna get take time. Everything is being delayed. And uh, things are coming in slightly over budget in in certain cases, and uh, just the nature of the game. I think uh, you know a lot of a lot of people may be new to the oil sector, and uh, you're you're kind of getting frustrated or or losing patience. And uh, you know, I'll tell you, I've been in this for for about ten years now, and uh, the the goal always was that hey, when the cycle comes, you always get a chance to make huge sums of money, and um, yeah, I I believe we're in the cycle now, and I'll I'll share more in my uh, macro update here next week. So, um, yeah, thanks again. So we'll do some questions here. There were some earlier questions that kind of got missed because somebody was uh, sending a bunch of spam. So if you can just uh, resend those, I would appreciate it. Uh, Paraday, nothing really to add on Paraday. Paraday is a company that's very exposed to gas, so. If you're buying, like if you're buying a, a pure play gas producer, it would come into those peers. They they have very little oil uh, production per se. Even even though they do, it's very sensitive to gas pricing. And eco pricing has not has not been doing all that great. Um, the only thing I can say is that Paraday trades at about one seventh the valuation uh, that Tourmaline does. So now you can say that um, you know Paraday's junk and all this. One seventh the valuation. It's up to you to decide whether that is accurate, whether that 
properly puts into account the increased risks of buying a smaller company, uh, a high ARO company versus a tourmaline, I cannot give you an, an answer. There is no like cheat book that says, oh yeah, something's trading at this much cheaper than it's a buy. It's, it's up to your own interpretation. I can just give you the facts. One seventh the price. Um, is Advantage one of the companies that had built infrastructure? Yes. Yeah, the Glacier plant is a 400 million standard cubic feet plant that also processes third-party um, revenue. And it's also great because it once you own your gas plants, you can make deals around carbon capture, around waste heat recovery, uh, around uh, modular design upgrades, et cetera. So companies that own their infrastructure effectively control the other parts of the uh, value chain, call it, as well. Blueberry First Nation thoughts. I don't really have any thoughts. Uh, your share prices have obviously spoken. The market has spoken that it was a nothing burger. I still think there are significant headwinds to um, call it full-scale field development. There are going to be delays. That is just the way the agreement was structured. Is it good that we have something uh, to, to work off of? Of course, definitely. Uh, but at the same time, um, I don't think it made the difference that a lot of people maybe thought it would um, because we're never going to return to those free, you know, freestanding agreements where every single well license is just approved, you know, uh, as if there's nothing wrong. We are probably never going to return to that in the oil and gas industry. There, there's going to be pushback on a lot of things, um, but it's good to have an agreement in place. Um, keep in mind, we're about 15 to 18 months delayed on when the agreement was supposed to be signed. So people have already lost patience and now they don't know what the delay is going forward. Um, that being said, I will be completely clear. I did not read it like all in detail and discuss it with anybody um, because I, I don't buy companies that are exposed to this problem. So I, it's it's a very legalese issue with a lot of deep um, kind of rooted problems that may re-pop up. And I, I for the most part, um, just refuse to invest in, in any companies that are, call it majorly affected uh, by this. Yeah, you bet. No, thanks. Thanks for joining. It's always, it's always fun. I mean, this, this is what makes it fun. I was almost uh, feeling you know, hey, I haven't done done a session in uh, you know two months now, two two yeah, just over two months now. So so I really wanted to get back into it, and then last week, you know, just wham, last minute I got I got slammed with this thing. So uh, glad to be back, and uh, I look forward to sharing more here, along with Twitter and Spaces and everything else. Um, as far as the Saturn Ridgeback analysis, I haven't had time to really go through it in detail, so I don't want to make um, huge like any sort of. Uh, a strong opinions. What I will say, and I've said this before, uh, I believe on a different space. In 2012, growth companies were trading for eight to 10 times cash flow and $100,000 plus per flowing barrel. That was the metric that was being used. Um, so when people are now trying to tell me that buying something at three times cash flow is a bad deal, um, justify it. Go ahead. I'm very happy to jump on any space. Um, and have a back and forth discussion. But if your bear case to me is that, oh, oil companies will never get re-rated ever again, that argument holds no water because you, unless you travel back from the future and you're telling me this, um, you, your opinion is the same as mine. We're, we're just arguing over what could happen. So I'm telling you that oil companies used to trade at these multiples. And when people believe that oil is in an oil scarcity environment and um, you know, for the foreseeable future, companies will once again trade trade at those multiples. Is it going to happen in six months? No, it's going to take a bit of time, especially with a lot of the the way the money the money allocators these days can't invest in these companies yet. Um, there's kind of a gap void that needs to be filled. But uh, I'll put it this way: people always want to make money, always, no matter who it is. As soon as money enters the table. A lot of other things go out the window, and uh, the oil and gas industry has shown now for three years, well, two years, let's say, the 2021 was market matching returns-ish, 2022 absolutely slaughtered the market. 
nothing was even close, like nothing, no other index was even close. Uh, so 2023 now, if oil can start to outperform again for call it, you know, part of the year, uh, people will start to pay attention. So, um, so yeah, when 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 Saturn bought Richback, call it you know seventeen thousand BOEs for five hundred some million, uh, call it thirty thousand flowing barrel. Even if they don't have the inventory runway that uh, maybe some of the other deals out there did, uh, I just like deals. I just like deals at at sub three times cash flow, you know, sub four times cash flow. They're all good deals. Uh, as long as you're not buying shale. So I will caveat that. High decline shale, if you're buying high decline shale with low inventory, um, yeah, I I just don't even look at those companies. Um, yeah, you bet. So, so I got a lot of questions on this uh, 88 energy uh, that I added to my personal portfolio. So again, I'm kind of going to be swimming against the a stream here. So um, Alaska has huge reserves of oil, not just in the North Slope, but there's an actual NPR, National Petroleum Reserve, that the U.S. maintains in Alaska, uh, where ConocoPhillips is doing their Willow project. There's a pickup project, um, call it 100,000 barrels per day plus projects that are coming online. Um, the problem with the NPR is that it's an environmentally sensitive area. So even though it's a petroleum reserve, um, as far as drilling and whatnot, it's it's just in a very environmentally sensitive area. There are two companies um, that are that are kind of have huge assets and are um, delineating assets right on the Dalton Highway. The Dalton Highway being the highway that goes up uh, through Alaska uh, all the way to the to the north um, uh, north slope. And on the Dalton Highway, you have the TAPS, the Trans Alaskan Pipeline System. So you have a road and you have a pipeline right there. The TAPS pipeline is about 25% full. So there's 1.5 million barrels of extra capacity in the pipeline uh, still to go. And our company's gonna find something, you know, maybe, maybe not. But there are two companies, 88 Energy being one of them, that, that's really spending time there um, to, to delineate, to find what's happening there. And uh, I'll put it this way. Pantheon's result was a success. They got out of 0.75 mile of lateral, they got 500 barrels per day of liquids and 2.5 MMCF per day of gas. Yes, you're flowing, flowing into flare. So the numbers are you know, over, uh, overdone as opposed to flowing into a pipeline. But at the same time, that's about a third the length of shale wells in the Permian. And they made 500 barrels of liquids and 2.5 MMCF per day of gas. Early shale results, we're not close to this. Early shale results in the Permian um, were costing a lot of money and they were not producing at, at these sorts of rates. So not, now that there's companies trying to delineate stuff in the, in the sort of Alaskan basin, I think there's a lot of shale potential there. Um, don't forget Prudhoe Bay is the largest conventional field uh, that's, that's been discovered in the US. And I think, I wanna say, yeah, in North America for sure. So there's a lot of potential. Um, companies have spent decades trying to find this acreage and the first well result proves there's not only a working petroleum system, but they can actually produce it uh, free flowing uh, on its own um, at really good rates. Now that's on a 0.75 mile lateral. Shale wells are two to three mile laterals. So once, once the development gets to that point, um, there's a potential that this acreage becomes kind of like the early Permian, um, early Permian when everything went crazy. Stuff started selling for hundred thousand uh, dollars of flowing uh, per acre, forty thousand dollars of flowing. Uh, sorry, per uh, per acre. So, are we early? Yes. Is Pantheon's corporate structure good? No. That's the reason I avoided it. That thing is diluted all to hell. There's there's no value left in that company because there's so much dilution. They don't have money. They, they don't really have the money to even drill another well. So I said, okay, I'll buy the company right next to it that has no debt. It has very good acreage. It's in the same SMD uh, shelf, margin, um, shelf margin delta uh, acreage. And um, we'll kind of see what happens. That's, that was my uh, play there. Um, when the well results 
uh, came out, I was very happy because uh, those are exceptional well results. The company Pantheon itself is uh, not a good investment um, just because of the way that, that the, the, the share structure is. Um, but I'm willing to take a bet on this. Uh, I did a lot of research into the, the geologic upside, um, not just the SMD, but the other basins on top. And uh, as well, I like the fact that, um, you know, they're, they're on the highway, they can drill year round, unlike other parts of Alaska, they can build gravel paths and drill and produce wells year round. And uh, 88 Energy will be drilling their, their next prospect here in uh, March or April. But um, yeah, and it's down 75% since last year. So it was a speculative play on a geologic um, phenomena where a different company is spending all the money to delineate it. And I can have the chance of finding something not as big as the Permian, but as productive as the Permian and definitely would scale which uh, is going to become quite valuable to the US uh, as the Permian shows its uh, kind of last signs of growth. So uh, that's that. I will have an Alaska focused session in late March, I believe. So I will discuss everything in more detail, uh, but because I got so many questions about this, uh, I think this question warrants um, a little bit more of a detailed answer uh, as well. And, and I'll give everybody full disclosure. I bought this at about, uh, 0 0.0062 cents. So um, yeah, that's my full disclosure uh, statement there. Uh, Saturn's acquisition. Yeah, so I just talked about Saturn. Yeah, um, it'll be interesting to see how well they do in the Montney and the Cardium. They've had some drilling failures in Southeast Saskatchewan, uh, but also a bunch of successes. So it's a new management team. They're not really oil guys. So yeah, we'll see how they do. I, um, uh, you know, I think the market is fully willing to give them a shot given that they already trade at a discount. So, I mean, you know, give it a shot and if you can prove it, then the market will uh, respect that and value you at a higher valuation. Uh, the one thing to note is that the June warrants likely are gonna expire worthless. So it takes out a lot of the big headwind uh, in terms of dilution that this stock had uh, on its head, especially with the increased share uh, share count now after this transaction. Uh, what are you seeing in oil service market trends? So rig rates keep going up. Equipment rates keep going up. Labor pricing keeps going up. Are service companies that capturing that extra margin? I don't know. And that's why I don't invest in services. Um, the easiest services companies to evaluate are offshore oil drillers because they tell you we have a contract at this price for this many years and you can literally run that number um, for, for all their drill ships and rigs and then say, okay, well, they don't really have that much cost. Like, like the cost is already a sunk cost to build the thing. And, um, and yeah, and now that it's built, the operating cost is relatively lower um, compared to let's say the margin on a onshore driller or a fracker where it's very difficult to, to know what the internal cost structure of the service company is quarter to quarter and, and how it goes up and down. It's, it's, it's very difficult to model um, that. So I've generally been staying away uh, from that. Um, so any news on PPR? So I'm on a restriction with PPR right now. I'm um, evaluating an, an asset um, in the data room. So I can't speak on PPR, unfortunately. Um, at the moment, um, what monthly producers are you in? So, so for me, I, I I like Crew Energy because Crew Energy has best reserves, the best undeveloped land acreage, uh, some of the best gas, uh, like gas plus oil um, optionality. They have tower and they have ground birch, pure gas, pure oil, and then it, they have everything in the middle. They have a huge Manias acreage. Uh, that's that's yet to be sort of delineated. They have one of the best management teams. They have the best board of directors uh, in the Montney, and uh, they trade at a relatively low multiple. They maintain a bit of debt, which I like. It's termed out to 2024. And um, yeah, if if anybody can make a case why I should be in a different Montney name, I'm all ears. Um, yeah, thoughts on journey at. I don't really have any thoughts. Um, I like the fact that they're expanding their power gen. 
it's a really, really good idea. Uh, the Alberta gas market has gone completely messed up. Um, the Alberta electricity market has got completely messed up because they shut off too much coal too fast. And so when the load gets higher, the, the power price just spikes. They don't even have the coal plants now to like start up in case of emergencies because they, they literally demolished them or converted them to, to, um, to gas turbines. So I, I really like what, uh, what Alex and team are doing there. They have the water floods, uh, of course, going. And they've recently drilled some pretty good wells. So, uh, hey, you know, I like, I like those kinds of management teams that just get it. They're willing to put their own net worth on the line and they understand the engineering and the geologic upside of these um, long life, low decline reservoirs. Uh, did you comment on surge? Uh, I don't really have anything to comment. I did a technical update in November that covered a lot of things and my latest uh, sort of comments. And yeah, I still got my position and nothing really, it's gonna take a catastrophic thing for me to sell my surge at this point because the they trade so low on a free cash flow multiple and then on a net asset value plus undeveloped land multiple they trade really low they've drilled the best wells in south saskatchewan they are drilling monster wells in the sparky and they're now capitalizing their mount bastion acreage up in ev red earth uh, which they paid 320 million dollars for this in 2018 so there's something there which is a lot of upside a lot of running room a lot of um, uh, water flood upside, and then along with other polymer floods or or other sort of floods, and a developing clear water area. So, uh, who knows? Maybe maybe worth uh, you know three or four exploratory drills uh, over there. Not not right in the acreage possibly, but but very close to it, and it can become a uh, sort of a blending skid area. Uh, yeah, the Vermilion options, I mean, they did end up as profitable as I could have sold them at. Um, they were up like 7x in whatever Vermilion was 37, 38 bucks. They were up 7x, both of them. And I ended up selling one up like 50 or some percent, and the one was up 200%, I think. Um, so, so definitely didn't capture as much upside as I should have. But um, you know, this is what I mean about long-term investing and getting into things that just don't make sense cheaply. It's hard to go wrong. Like the, the downside on them is relatively low. Uh, and you know, like everything that went, that could have gone wrong with, with Vermilion went wrong from September to December, everything went wrong and still ended up on a, you know, with, with really good gains on those options. So, um, yeah, I feel the same about, about junior companies and everything else is just like buy things cheap and the macro, the macro doesn't have to even work out. It just has to not completely collapse. And uh, over, a, over a longer time frame, the investments are going to work out really well and they're definitely going to outperform against uh, their peers and they're going to outperform. Well, it's not even a question. They're going to absolutely destroy everything else in the broad market. So um Again, that's my my view. Uh, was there any update on Westcan? So I shared my thoughts on the Twitter thread that I put out. Um, when was that? Yesterday or, or two days ago? And that's kind of the latest I have. I am still looking to do a kind of a full analysis on the well, figure out what exactly happened here. Um, my belief is that drilling right on top of the existing fracked well was probably the reason why we're having a lower uh, oil rate. The water rate has always been high. The Rex wells that West Can fracked both have 75% water cuts. So nothing new there, um, but the oil rate um, is lower definitely. And we're gonna see how it stabilizes here as things go on. Um, when you leave multilateral wells shut in, especially right on top of a frack that it could have communicated with, um, you know, there, there's just too much unknown right now. Um, as I've said, management is is absolutely atrocious at giving out the proper information. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna do a post mortem sort of analysis on the well, and then figure out where kind of where where we proceed from there. Uh, at this point, okay, I think we're like three, more than three hours in, so I might uh, cut this out after these questions. So 
Do you have opinions on OBE and CPG? Uh, I like Obsidian. I, I really like Obsidian. It is a got lots of optionality. It's got lots of tax pools. It's got uh, upside on the blue sky Clearwater acreage, and they've got financial leverage on that, and they're growing. I mean, what else could describe a perfect pick in a bullish structural oil market? That's that's exactly what you want: heavy, heavy oil, high net backs, uh, good oil weighting, and uh, yeah, name that I continue to hold. And I bought options on this in my personal portfolio update. Uh, as of um, two weeks ago or so. So yeah, Crescent Point, I don't I don't really have much to add. Um, not sure I'm really on board with how, how aggressive they're going in the Duvernay. It's pretty hard to make money in the Duvernay and the well costs are skyrocketing. So if Crescent Point didn't have the Duvernay and they were trading at, at like a similar multiple, I would be quite interested. Uh, but but given where they are, given what they paid for for Paramount's Duvernay acreage, uh, not not a huge fan of, of getting into Shaley plays like that that have a ninety percent year one decline. Uh, yeah, eighty to ninety percent. It's it's tough to get out of your own hamster wheel doing that. Yeah, I don't invest in any oil field technologies. I'll just be honest, like. Uh, because I used to run run these technologies, I used to myself use them on my fields, and ninety five percent of of them are snake oil. They don't work, um, and the other five percent that actually work never get the approval from management to actually install them. So, yeah, the oil field moves very very slowly um, in terms of like the legacy assets and getting them up to speed. On new assets, they move very fast. They're using state-of-the-art automation and technology, but on legacy assets, um, very, very, very slow procedure. So I've mostly been out of that, but uh, I appreciate the, uh, the information there. Uh, no, no updates on Avila. That was always gonna be a two to three year story. I was hoping they'd get the Northeast BC gas up by now, but they haven't. So honestly, still waiting, nothing. Uh, Nothing of substance to report. Uh, Coelacanth, nothing much to report there either. It's, it's, it's again a two to three year story. Like by looking at one well result is not gonna give you anything because the company is already valued very richly as if they're gonna go and grow much higher. So uh, not, not much to share there. Uh, I don't think Vermilion is going to buy Silicant right away. They're going to wait for them to delineate it and do some work, build some plants, um, because Vermilion has their own acreage. Like, why, why go in there? But but they've definitely taken a big stab at it with sixty something million shares, so that nobody else can come in and buy it uh, when the time comes. Yeah, I did sell my ROK uh, rock resources around. Uh, I think I sold half around fifty cents, and I sold half around forty four. Uh, sense. So um, it did its job very, very well. Great management team, phenomenal. Um, but it did its job. I needed a, a, a junior that could hedge me through June to December. Um, and it did exactly that. And now I don't like the hedges going forward. Um, and I don't, I don't like companies that are going to be doing lots of acquisitions. So I've got out, yes, but a phenomenal management team and lots of upside uh, in in that name for sure, uh, and still very undervalued, kind of versus its peers. Even though it's had a run, it's not really trading all that expensive. Uh, yeah, and that's even with the warrants all being exercised. Yeah, still still waiting on Meg. Like nothing. I don't think anything is imminent. I still think it gets taken out. Yes. Uh, at what point? Not entirely sure. Um, one of the things to, that I recently learned about Meg was that they actually had reserves booked for Sermont, and those got taken away. Uh, I think it's after five years, reserves get taken away if you don't develop that acreage. So there's an extra, I think, 500 million barrels or something of reserves that got taken away uh, from Sermont. So I, so that's a possibility. If uh, call it you know another major 
or even ConocoPhillips wants to go in and, and really buy out that entire Sermon package, uh, possibly, is it going to happen right now? No, um, probably still quite a bit out. Uh, that being said, Meg is at its 50% free cash flow to share buybacks uh, time. And if oil prices, let's say, are in the $100 range uh, this year, by the end of this year, call it early Q4, they will be at 100% free cash flow to buybacks. So a company that's buying back 3 to 4% of their float every month, of course, they're going to run into TSX problems in terms of what they can buy. But you get where I'm going with this is the share price has this really strong tailwind to it. And um, Meg has a lot of strong shareholders. Meg's shareholders are very strong. 50, 60, 70% of the company is tied up. So as you keep buying back uh, shares on the open market, you kind of get rid of the traders and the short-term holders. And eventually people just want more money for this thing. I mean, Meg was trading at 40 something dollars in 20, 2014, I think I want to say. So now that they've paid back all the debt, why would somebody sell it for 22 bucks? Like, um, it just doesn't make sense. People who have been with the story for, for 10 years are now going to wait. They're going to wait for 50, 60, 70 dollars a share. And if somebody can make a stab at buying it out before it gets there, you know, have at her. Um, if they don't, the, the share buybacks will do the trick in terms of bringing the true valuation uh, out on this company. Yeah, I like Tamarack. The Clearwater water floods are not being taken into account yet. They are bringing out really good results. Uh, in some cases, the Clearwater water floods are bringing production back above the IP30. So, um, and Tamarack has a lot of acreage there uh, that's underwater flood or could be put underwater flood. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to continue to hold my position. They're drilling pretty good stuff in the Charlie Lake. And um, yeah, I, I'd rather have my clear water exposure with a company that's trading cheaper and uh, has a bit of runway to grow as well. So, yeah, it's going to stay there. That, like, those names are going to stay there for, for quite a while. Like, there's a reason I picked my top five as far as um, call it anchoring my margin portfolio to, there's a reason I picked them. Low decline names with lots of conventional production, with lots of growth upside, with lots of tax pools, with a bit of financial leverage and very little hedging. Um, all five of, the, of my top names meet that criteria. And uh, Tamarack's definitely in that. Could you comment on Razor if oil remains under 90? Um, nothing really to comment. Uh, if, if oil stays under 90, it's gonna underperform versus its peers. If oil goes above 90, um, the peers are not even gonna be in the rear view mirror kind of thing. So that's that's really that's really what, what it is. Uh, there's, there's no need to really complicate it. And uh, if, if the company survived, in 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021. And you're gonna tell me that now it's gonna go bankrupt all of a sudden? Like, what, what exactly ground are you standing on? Because if the company survived in a 50, $60 environment, it, it, it survived 2020, why would it all of a sudden go under right now, right? So, so a bit of the hyperboles around these junior names, um, I get quite frustrated, but uh, I continue to buy. So, I mean, if you think there's there's significant risk here, then there's various other companies in the oil patch. You, you don't have to buy these kinds of companies. But uh, yeah, like I said, my view on oil prices is, is quite aggressive. And I like companies with huge original oil in place that can now be recovered with, with methods that have been invented or, or perfected in the last 10 years. So that, that's all I'll say on that. Uh, yeah, there, there's no dry gas zone in ARC's CACWA acreage, but um, they still continue to drill good wells. It's just the wells are not going to be as good as they were. So, um, yeah, the CACWA is still one of the top acreages in the Montney, if not the top um, little, little pool there, if you will. So, yeah. And, once they decline, they just decline. Like, look at the Eagleford, look at the Bakken, and run the, the production curve on it. 
That's exactly what's going to happen to Kakwa. That's exactly what's going to happen to the Montney. But it just depends the shape of the curve. Is it going to be that curve that I showed on the Barnett shale? Uh, or is it going to be the curve that Hammerhead put out where they maintain 30 years at 60,000 BOEs? So that's really all that matters. Uh, Synovus, huge free cash flow should be coming. Um, yeah, I haven't really been following Synovus that much. Um, but yeah, I think they're they're kind of getting there at this point, yeah. Um, if they don't change their debt target, moving goalposts again. So uh, yeah, just be careful of that. Uh, yeah, once again, I already I already spoke about Paradate. Not not much to say. It's it's a very high highly financially leveraged name. So please do your due diligence on that one for sure. Uh, yeah, and I've got a presentation on that as well. Why are you avoiding Vermilion? I'm I'm not avoiding Vermilion. I'm actively looking at the options. They are too expensive at this point for me to enter them. The equity itself. Uh, although I would like to enter the equity and I am looking at uh, ways to enter the equity, it's very difficult to make it fit in a margin portfolio because of the intraday and intra month volatility on it is just insane. So it's still going to end up in my portfolio, I think, at some point here uh, this year, sooner than later. Uh, but at the same time, it's kind of got to be structured a certain way where it's either going to be smaller position on equity, at which point it doesn't even make sense to enter it versus a junior name, uh, or I'm going to have to find a way to kind of hedge myself against the, the, the volatility, or I find some really good options that are maybe um, more out of the money that I can go into. So yeah, still, still watching. Yeah, Baytex is doing great. I mean, the Clearwater is just fantastic for them, the P-Vine. Um, I worry about the scale they can get to at some point. Uh, will be interesting to see. I haven't heard anything about them water flooding their P vines, so that'll be interesting to see. Uh, but people already know that that the P vine is good. So, like, if they keep drilling 800 barrel per day wells, I don't think the you know people are really gonna give them way more credit. Like, yeah, they might still re-rate the stock a little bit, but right now it's pretty known that the that the P-Vine is the best clear water acreage, and there's enough scale there to get production up uh, significantly, for sure. Um, but yeah, thanks for asking. And with that, I think uh, that's all we have. So once again, I really appreciate everybody's time joining in, joining us here in 2023 as we uh, restart these sessions. I got the macro update coming in next week. It's going to be a short macro update, so not not the fully long ones. And then we're going to really talk about a US shale. So company by company, I will show you acreage by acreage, uh, which companies have maxed out, which companies are going to start declining. There are companies that have drilled so much of their acreage that they can't even maintain their current rate of production. So there are companies that will decline um, and uh, are into like their tier three, tier four infill drilling stuff. Uh, so we'll talk about that. And then February 5th, I am going to be doing like a uh, investment portfolio overview update, um, uh, not update, like a review of 2022 transactions. So look forward to kind of sharing that, some of the things that went right, some of the things that went wrong, uh, how I've adjusted my models and my mentality here uh, to try and take advantage of the cycle. And uh, yeah, we'll just... Uh, Keep on keeping on. The recording will be uh, on here in a few hours. And once again, if you would like to join the mailing list where I send the Zoom links, uh, my email is right here uh, on this page or shoot me a DM on Twitter as well. Uh, still kind of catching up on, on some of the messages. So uh, yeah, well, hope everybody has a great rest of the weekend, whatever's left here. And uh, we will see you um, on a Twitter space or in the markets here. Uh, or next weekend. Uh, cheers.